Thank you, President D'Annunzio. And let me begin by acknowledging our teachers and staff who have had to reinvent and reimagine uh, education over the last 10 months. And I also want to acknowledge our parents, their family members, and friends who have put many parts of their life on hold to support their children's learning. We appreciate it. Uh, we have a full meeting this evening uh, structured as follows. Uh, first, we'll hear a brief update uh, regarding the state of COVID-19 in Yolo County. Uh, second, we'll receive a presentation on the secondary uh, hybrid model recommendation and ask for action on that. Third, we'll receive a staff presentation about the elementary and preschool hybrid model recommendations and ask for action on that. And fourth, we can decide whether to address the remaining part of the motion that was tabled from our January 19th board meeting to tonight around a deadline date to continue with distance learning uh, uh, for the rest of the school year at some point in time. And that is uh, discussion for consideration later this evening. Uh, lastly, I'd like to suggest that we hear all public comment on the steps to return to campus presentation after the secondary model discussion. Um, a lot of the emails cover various points related to the return to campus. And this way we could make sure we have heard um, any and all comments uh, related to all parts and beginning with the secondary model discussion. Um, Superintendent Pose, if I could ask you to pause for a moment there. Uh, I don't know that we need a, a vote on this, but I would like to see general consensus on the public comment that that timing is okay for my colleagues. Okay, I am seeing general consensus. Thank you, sorry to interrupt you, Superintendent Pose. Not a problem. And when it comes time for public comment, uh, I believe we have 36 public comments to date. Uh, so for the board to consider um, uh, at that time, how to best handle. All right, uh, next slide, please. And we all look forward to a time when we can greet all, all of our students back in the classroom. Since March, we've been thinking purposefully and strategically. And our decisions have been rooted in our values, um, best contained perhaps in our DJUSD mission statement, and in our six principles. And they have continued to guide our decision-making and inform our work. Um, the principles uh, have been something we have relied on uh, regularly in our board meetings uh, to inform how we best address the pandemic and our response to it. And we'll learn more about the state of COVID-19 in Yolo County uh, since Tuesday's meeting uh, from Associate Superintendent of Student Support Services, Laura Juanitas. And let's turn the presentation over to her. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, Dr. Bose. Good evening, trustees and student representatives. So currently, Yolo County has posted 53.9 COVID cases per day per 100,000, an adjusted case rate of 28.3, and a test positivity rate of 6.7%. Test positivity rate is, as I've said in the last few board meetings, lowest than it's been since November. And although that sounds really good, if we look at the daily numbers for Yolo County this week, on Tuesday, we had 228 new cases. Yesterday, we posted in the county 298 new cases. And today, we've posted 167 new cases. So I'll explain a little bit why this is happening. I was in a meeting this morning with Dr. Sisson, and she said that the infection rate in the community is as high, if not higher now, than it was a couple of weeks ago, even though the test positivity rate is declining. She said that what has changed in the last week is that the testing data related to the hundreds of saliva tests being done by UC Davis and the Healthy Davis Together sites is only now being included in the Yolo County numbers. To get the test positivity rate, we take the number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests being done. So although our, test num our total number of positive tests is still quite high, the test positivity rate is showing as lower than a week ago because the total number of tests being done has dramatically increased. 
So bottom line is the infection rate in the community is very high and it's only looking like it's improving because we are testing so many more people in the community than we were a week ago. Next slide, please. So currently we're in phase two of our return to campus plan, which includes a partial return of students with urgent needs. Our small student cohorts are currently serving over 200 students on campus, and we continue to complete special education assessments and provide special education services on campus. In order to move into phase three or a hybrid return, which would bring all students back to campus, the county would need to be in the red tier for five consecutive days. And now I'll turn this over to Associate Superintendent Roddy Bunshoy. Thank you, Associate Superintendent Juanitas. Good evening, trustees. Uh, this is one last recap of our roadmap to phase three, which includes these five stages here and also how we came to the models that will be under discussion for this evening. Uh, recall that we collected data from staff and family surveys through November, developed reopening criteria through our superintendent's advisories, facilitated a large staff action team to develop the elementary and secondary model, and are now moving into the pink bar for model selection. Next slide. The re reopening criteria has helped us to evaluate the quality of the hybrid model and importantly, shed insights on the strengths and limitations, which will help us for planning. Next slide. The reopening criteria were generated by the all advisories and organized into the rubric you see here and are organized by the categories on the left, including health and safety, efficacy of instruction, social emotional uh, learning, equity and access and structural compatibility and continuity. And tonight we will present an evaluation of some of these indicators for both the elementary and secondary models. Next slide. Our staff action team of roughly 120 regular attendees collectively developed these models. Uh, they represent uh, almost every role in the district. This work was difficult because the implications of each decision and feature of a model were many, uh, which you will see when we discuss those models. We are very grateful for the collaboration of our dedicated staff who contributed to this work. It was not easy. Next slide. These are the stakeholder groups who helped evaluate the models, including large cabinet, all site administrators, the action team, the superintendents all advisory. Each review resulted in revisions and further clarity on the practical implications of the many of any transition to a hybrid model. And throughout the work, we maintained ongoing and productive collaboration with our labor partners. Let me turn it back over to uh, Superintendent Bose. Thank you, Superintendents Bunchoy and Juanitas. We now come to the staff recommendation for a secondary hybrid model. I wanna thank the many staff who have lent their expertise, time and effort to the development of both our models that we'll hear about tonight. And likewise, thank you to the many parents, community members and staff who have participated in the all advisory committee work since November to help vet these models. Director of Secondary Education and Leadership, Troy Allen, will now kick off this part of the presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you and good evening. The first thing I wanna call attention to is in our model, the word cohort is no longer used and instead we're using the term hybrid group A and B when discussing the groups in the hybrid model. We're working to be sure that cohort is understood as a stable group following the current guidelines um, used in phase two, while hybrid, we have smaller groups of students, but they are not stable or fixed throughout the day. Within the action team, secondary staff generally held consensus on several things. Specifically that a hybrid model should have students uh, in person two days a week in an A, B hybrid groups and one full day of cleaning, collaboration and planning. The teams also agreed that lunch should be grab and go and that a simulcast option would be feasible for students on their off days or for those that are not joining in the in-person model. The model that we'll review here and for quarter four honors those sentiments and is familiar. It is a near replication of quarter one and two. This model maintains consistency across the phases one, two, and three, and in case of a need to revert back to distance learning. We see that the hybrid group A is at school on Monday and Tuesday and at home on Thursday, Friday. All students are distance learning virtually on Wednesdays and then hybrid group B is a direct flip. The students leave after their last class and the afternoon is gen, uh, generally accessed digitally. On Wednesday mornings, classes are held virtually 
And please note that the model maintains our advisory period. The, um, the move of small group instruction was made. You'll notice in quarter one, it existed on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. In the hybrid schedule, we moved it to Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays, as we noted that attendance was quite low on Fridays uh, during quarter one. And you'll note that there are breaks that are 10 minutes in length. Um, that is a result of asking our staff asking us to allow more time so that we could stagger the release and control of volumes of students moving from class to class. Next slide. Quarter four maintains the same features. The primary thing to call out during this quarter is that seventh period is after lunch. This means that students that have a seventh period will stay on campus to eat. Staff at the secondary level are already evaluating their site with student nutrition services so that this can be done with health and safety precautions in place. Next slide. So these are the high level characteristics of the hybrid model and it includes that students will be in either hybrid group A or B. They will follow the quarter block schedule regardless of the group that they're in, and they'll participate in in-person instruction two days a week and virtually three days a week. It's important to note that on uh, the during at-home instructional days, students will be simulcasting in concurrent time while instruction is happening in the classroom with the in-person group. Wednesdays will continue the format we've maintained throughout quarter one and two, and all students will Zoom from home and participate in synchronous and asynchronous instruction virtually. Next slide. Our expectation during hybrid instruction is that special education and English learner interventions and services are push in, pull out throughout the day and the week. The blue intervention block, however, is designated and protected time for students who receive support and students may stay on campus for that support period. We currently have students who are participating in cohorts because we discerned that daily contact was critical and we brought them onto campus for phase two. Those students in the distance learning cohort group will continue to be on our campus daily when we transition to phase three. They will attend their courses in person with their classes, but in the afternoons, Wednesdays, and off days, they will be in their cohort facilitated by their cohort lead. The small group instruction blocks allow for teachers to meet in smaller groups with students, have more personal check-ins, do some reteaching, or facilitate the student-to-student -student collaboration time sometimes needed. All students will attend and then be released by their teacher to do independent work. This space is not where staff presents any new content. Next slide. So recall that on Wednesdays, all students are at home participating in distance learning as they do now. Teachers will start each class synchronously and then have discretion on the amount of synchronous or asynchronous time that occurs during the class period. The afternoon on Wednesdays provides time for staff collaboration. This collaboration includes staff meetings, whole staff professional development, grade level meetings, designated time for special education and English learner specialists to plan and work with general education staff and teacher preparation. Next slide. Lunches will be provided in a grab and go format during quarter three. This includes an opportunity to grab breakfast for the following day as well. Our phase two cohort students may stay on campus for lunch prior to moving to the cohort classroom. Quarter four students with the seventh period will eat on campus following the health and safety protocols. And cleaning occurs at the end of each day. Director Bernard will now speak to the technology supports that are critical to hybrid in-person planning. Thank you, Troy. Good evening. Um, turning to technology, several new realities will be in play as we reopen our schools. Canvas, our new learning management system, is now in use district-wide. Staff and students continue to gain aptitude and confidence in the use of Canvas for instruction, assignment management, grading, collaboration, and more. Canvas has what we call LTIs, which are learning tool interoperabilities, which allow many other platforms used for instruction to integrate seamlessly into Canvas. Canvas integrates with Zoom for any students in distance learning as well. BYOD and one-to-one -one technology, DJUSD is currently in the process of implementing one-to-one -one technology in preparation for reopening. Upon students' return to campuses, we will be a one-to-one -one district with a projected 25% of students opting to bring their own device. We call this BYOD. Any student who needs a Chromebook 
or internet hotspot will be assured such access. Headsets and dot cams. Um, headsets and document cameras are currently be being provided and distributed for any instructional staff member who requests one. These tools provide benefit for both distance and in-person instruction. Finally, bandwidth. DGUSD has done a thorough assessment on bandwidth usage and we believe our connections to all sites with the possible exception of Davis High School were adequate. All schools route their internet connections through the district office. We are now finalizing a bandwidth increase for both Davis High School and the district office through AT&T. In the past three months, we have also upgraded our DJUSD firewall to accommodate these increased network speeds. And with that, I will pass it on to Associate Superintendent, Laura Juanitas. Thank you. Health and safety measures for secondary students will remain a core feature of the hybrid models and a return of all students to campus. This is based on four key factors, social distancing a six feet in classroom and outdoors, wearing a face covering at all times when on campus unless medically exempt, frequent hand washing and daily cleaning and disinfection of all student and staff spaces on campus, and daily health screening at home by all students and staff before coming onto campus. In addition, we continue to message to staff and families the need to stay home when they are sick and to report any COVID symptoms to our reporting email. We have robust contact tracing and quarantine protocols in place and COVID saliva testing for asymptomatic students and staff will be available on 13 DJUSD campuses by March 1st. When reopening, district nurses will provide virtual and in-person health and safety training to staff, students, and parents, and will continue to be available to answer health and safety questions as they arise. An important point we have learned so far with small cohorts is that everyone on campus needs ongoing training and retraining as public health guidelines continue to evolve. And now I will hand this back to Director Allen. Thank you. When we transition to phase three, we know that some families uh, won't return to campus. So our second stu secondary students will continue in distance learning through simulcast and follow the same schedule as our students attending in person through the hybrid model. Students will maintain the same classes, schedules and teachers that they have now. And because we've never done this before and conditions change rapidly, we want to have a flexible process for our families to transition from distance learning to in-person learning if desired. We will create an articulated process and offer flexibility as space allows. Director Perez. Thank you, Director Allen, and good evening. As we discuss and lay the foundation for a future transition to a hybrid model when conditions permit, I'm proud to state that we are all well resourced as an English learner staff to provide the necessary support to ensure the academic success of our English learner students. Our staff are nimble and fully committed to providing individualized supports based on observations and student data. Students will continue to receive targeted English language development throughout the day in order to continue to build their English language proficiency. Designated ELD, a specialized form of instruction for English learner students, focused on language during a particular time will be readily available to further support students. Furthermore, in other content areas such as science, math, and social studies, students will receive integrated ELD support to access core content. In addition, as an added layer of support for students identified by staff, individualized interventions will be assigned to students during the intervention block. During the previous quarter, many secondary English learner students took full advantage of this intervention resource. Finally, the use of timely and accurate data is fundamental to providing support for our students, much of which could not happen without assessments. Currently, our staff is working diligently to operationalize the Summative English Language Proficiency Assessments of California, LPAC, in order to administer it remotely, much like we did in the fall with the initial LPAC. And now, let me turn it over to Director Patrick McGrew. Thank you, Director Perez, and good evening. Special Education services will be delivered during the in-person instructional blocks through push-in and pull-out models, as well as during the students' scheduled support classes. Support will also be provided during asynchronous time during the afternoon intervention, small group, and individual work times. 
students receiving intervention support may be on campus receiving support services on days other than their group scheduled hybrid days and students who participated in a small cohort during phase two may remain on campus daily to receive special education services from phase two cohort leads. Wednesday afternoons are designated for teacher collaboration, preparation time and staff meetings. The collaboration time is essential for special education and general education teachers to use to implement universal design for learning principles into their lessons to ensure that all students can access the curriculum. IEP meetings will be held during both synchronous and asynchronous time periods and after school to ensure that the meetings can be held in a timely manner. I will now pass the presentation back to Dr. Boon Choi. Thank you, Director McGrew. So we're gonna, we're gonna shift now to, into the evaluation of the uh, secondary hybrid model. And this is the detailed assessment completed by the staff action team who informed the development of the model and the all advisory who created the criteria for the assessment. You can see we had many people participate, upwards of 200 across the action team and advisories, uh, and evenly split between elementary and secondary. We had between 70 to 80 survey responses for each elementary, for each for elementary and for secondary. So completion was uh, the com completion rate was high. The rubric survey includes 23 indicators that were evaluated. And those indicators are organized by uh, the five categories: health and safety, efficacy of instruction. Uh, SEL, equity and access, and structural compatibility. The long form of the presentation, which is attached to the board item for tonight's meeting, has a slide for every single indicator, all 46. We'll just cover one indicator per category for, uh, for this presentation. Next slide, please. The first one for secondary is health and safety. This indicator is for the frequency of cohort transitions. And you can see there's a six point scale for the assessment in the stacked bar graph shows action team responses in blue and all advisory responses in orange. The assessment of this indicator score is around two as there would be three groups of in-person students by periods, secondary periods, uh, transitioning through the day. That grows to four groups in the fourth quarter. Other important points for health and safety uh, in this category includes concerns about social distancing among students particularly during passing periods and lunch, and how to ensure adequate cleaning and disinfection with so many students transitioning throughout the day. Next slide. The next category is uh, efficacy of instruction, which focused on the quality of teaching and learning in the model. This indicator reflects whether there would be adequate grade and content level instruction and innovation. It scores at roughly three and four, and biggest concern from the qualitative feedback is around simulcast, uh, which requires a teacher to teach to virtual and in-person students simultaneously. Part of the concern is that it would stifle innovation and promote a lecture format. It does, however, maintain student schedules, regardless of a choice for hybrid or distance only. Respondents also commented that hands-on activities would be hindered by safety protocols, which would reduce collaboration and small group activities due to social distancing and the challenge of engaging with, with virtual peers. Next slide. Uh, this category focuses on social emotional learning and this particular indicator addresses daily peer-to-peer -peer interactions between students. We know this is important for student well-being, and it scores differently between the groups. Parents on advisories see the model as an opportunity for kids to see each other. While staff are wrestling with the realities of keeping students apart, for safety and struggling with meaningful interactions between in-person and virtual peers. There is a real social emotional tension in the qualitative feedback. Uh, these, uh, the survey included the, qu the quantitative as well as comments uh, that we synthesized uh, to better understand uh, these results. Uh, and that tension is um, between the benefits of being in physical proximity to student peers and the potential anxiety of students not feeling safe on campus due to the health and safety risks. There were also positive comments about the continuation of advisory, and you saw that was uh, built into the model that uh, Troy described. Next slide. This category is on equity and access. We do see a positive rating for structures that support students receiving special ed and English learner services. This is due to the fact that we intentionally built in time for supports at the onset of model development. Uh, there were comments, however, about the challenges of students whose scheduled support class is off quarter, uh, which is the challenge we're currently facing. 
There were also concerns about small group supports that may not be as effective with distancing, and importantly, the challenge of differentiation of instruction through simulcast. And finally, structural compatibility and continuity is about overall viability and operations of the schedule. This indicator refers to whether teachers can generally manage their time and workload, uh, which, evaluate, which evaluates on the medium low end and tells us that there would be an increase in teacher prep and their workload. This is an important one that we will revisit for elementary. Uh, we also anticipate general logistical disruptions that would come with the transition. However, we did see that the schedule is generally manageable for families, that one rated uh, fairly high. Uh, again, for more details regarding the other indicators, please see the long form of this presentation. I'm also happy to answer questions to them uh, during discussion. Uh, let me turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Matt Best. Thanks, Roddy. Uh, I'll be sharing some of the implications and challenges that staff in the community have identified with the current models. Uh, as a result of the secondary scheduling format, uh, cleaning and disinfection will primarily occur at the end of the school day um, once students have left, left campus. Um, as was discussed at uh, Tuesday's board meeting, uh, extracurricular and co-curricular activities will be available to students with health, uh, health and safety protocols in place. Um, and as we're thinking about the amount of live and uh, synchronous instruction uh, that will occur in a hybrid model versus our current distance learning model, you can see that students may receive more live synchronous instruction. However, I will note that in distance learning, many teachers provide more than the minimum number of live synchronous instruction minutes, minutes which is what, what is noted um, on the slide. Uh, and there is the strong possibility that those numbers will be uh, relatively equal. Um, since simulcast is such a significant shift in our pedagogical model, teachers will need clear expectations uh, regarding simulcast and professional development and best practices for this new teaching method. Because secondary schools include specialized credential teachers, some of whom uh, may be unable to return in person um, and may not be able to be replaced easily with substitutes, um, a uh, as a result, um, some staff may continue to teach from home um, with a staff member in the room supervising um, in-person students. However, this may have a deleterious effect on our substitute pool and this option will need to be used sparingly. We expect that some students will remain on campus in the afternoons uh, for in-person supports and lunch, especially if that student is currently attending a small cohort. We know that we'll need to prioritize cohort assignments for siblings attending other secondary schools uh, and potentially elementary schools as well. I'll now hand the presentation back to Associate Superintendent Buchway. Thank you, Matt. Okay, so we know that a transition of this scale will require training and support for our teachers. And so we've created a three-phase professional development strategy to help our team move forward. And much of it is based on what we've learned in distance learning uh, at through and through the continuous improvement of our practices over the past 10 months. Uh, it's also based on honoring teacher voice and their expertise and keeping a focus on student learning as we think about how to develop teacher uh, capacity. As outlined in this plan, phase one will focus on a staff-wide launch so that we're, uh, we're, we're consistently oriented uh, to the expectations of the model and focused on core practices that will be necessary in a hybrid. Uh, we'll use an EdCamp format, and that's a way to prioritize the urgent instructional needs uh, of our teachers and then leverage the collective expertise to support those needs. The focus of phase two is on access and training for Canvas collaboration spaces and structured sharing and networking uh, for teachers. And I've spoken about these, uh, these collaboration spaces in, in past meetings so that we can connect teachers to resources and sharing the best practices. And we can't underestimate the value of this new infrastructure that Canvas avails. Uh, it will serve us now and into the future. Oh, you're muted, Roddy. Sorry, I don't know how I did that. Uh, phase three will support, uh, will be flexible and ongoing. And this phase of professional learning is adapted in response to teacher need. So they have just-in-time support that's timely targeted and portable. And the portability is an important point because we can adjust and modify the topics, the focus, the duration, depending on how conditions evolve uh, and what the model is gonna require of our teachers. Back to you, Deputy Superintendent Best. 
Oh, never mind. Sorry, one more for me. Uh, the hands-on workshops will be uh, level specific as the secondary and elementary hybrid models are different. Most secondary professional development will focus on concurrent simulcast teaching so that they can work on moves and tactics, tactics to be effective in the dual environment that they'll be teaching. Uh, the exciting thing, thing about the hands-on workshops is that they include mock lessons with peers so they can practice new moves, observe each other, reflect, and grow as a team. We've had a lot of teacher collaboration this year, and we want to continue supporting that. It's essential to, to our professional learning. I also want to uh, thank our instructional coaching team who have spent the last weeks developing the strategy uh, to target the very real professional development, development needs of our staff uh, with a hybrid model. As, uh, they put a lot of thoughtful uh, work and thinking uh, as a team. All right, now I'll turn it back over to Deputy Superintendent Matt Pest. Thanks, Roddy. And the final step before uh, staff and students return for in-person instruction includes the many logistical and technical actions uh, to support that in-person model. And we prepared for and completed many uh, of those things um, well ahead of any reopening. But there are still some things that we will need to contend with, uh, like staff and student reassignments, finalizing any uh, remaining negotiations, uh, providing staff and students uh, needed trainings, particularly around health and safety, um, and ensuring um, technology and any instructional supports are deployed or in technology's case, uh, potentially redeployed. Uh, and all the while being acutely aware of the variables that are outside of our control, like infection rates, shifting policies and developments at the federal, state or local level that may affect the direction uh, of this work. Let me hand the presentation back to Superintendent Bose. Thanks Deputy Superintendent Best and thanks to all the staff who prepared the presentation and presented this evening. And again, thanks to all the staff, students, parent and parents and community members who participated in our stakeholder engagement process. That brings us to this point tonight. Let me now turn it back to President Denunzio. Thank you, Superintendent Bose, uh, and thank you to staff for uh, that presentation. Uh, and again, those that are watching who want to see the more detailed uh, rubric elements, they are uh, attached to the agenda and the trustees have copies of it as well. Um, so now we're going to uh, uh, see if we have any public comment on this item. Uh, I happen to know that we do have some public comment item on it. Um, so uh, Ms. Clayton, could you let us know if in fact my prognostication is correct? Yes, we have um, currently 37 public comments on this agenda item. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, this board is prioritized, although uh, we've seen uh, you know, we read everything that comes in. This board has prioritized this, uh, and so, um, colleagues, with your uh, with your assent, uh, I think we should hear all of these comments. Are we in general agreement on this? I'm seeing uh, assent, so uh, uh, please proceed. Okay. Uh, order, uh, President Denunzio. Just yes, to... Trustee Adams. Uh, are all the comments we've received posted? yet on the agenda or will that be tomorrow? It will be sometime tonight. Sometime tonight, okay. So anyone who doesn't, because for audio reasons or can't hear that or connection reasons, they'll be able to read it later tonight. Yeah. All right, okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Trustee Adams. Okay, please proceed. Okay. So our first public comment reads, Dear DGSD trustees, I am writing as a parent of a DGSD student to express my strong support for an in-person learning option as soon as local conditions permit. It is increasingly clear that students and teachers can return to school safely using an evidence-based layered approach to prevention consisting of masks, hygiene, screening, and testing. Many studies have indicated that COVID-19 is not being spread in the school setting, even in areas with high case rates, if these mitigation strategies are followed. We have a unique opportunity in Davis to use testing and real-time data analysis offered by Healthy Davis Partnership to facilitate getting students back to school. In our current efforts to keep kids and teachers safe, we must equally consider the harms caused by pro prolonged remote learning, which affect every child in our district. While academic concerns such as learning loss 
may be the most obvious of these harms, I'm concerned that profound isolation brought on by the loss of our vibrant school communities will have long lasting repercussions for many students in Davis. We can't in good conscience fail to take bold action now when the science shows that we have the ability and the means to mitigate the risks of disease to an acceptable degree. Sincerely, Megan Robin. The next public comment reads, Dear President Genencio, please, oh, excuse me. Um, okay. Dear trustees and members of the Board of Education, we are the parents of two young students at Pioneer Elementary. Our oldest son is in first grade and has autism spectrum disorder and youngest son is in kindergarten. We wanna share our concerns about the plans for implementing the hybrid model for return to campus. We need to think about the well-beings of our children's teachers and staff. It is not safe to go back to school. There are new SARS cov two variants circulating and the vaccine is still not available for teachers and the rest of the community. Distance learning has been challenging for children, parents and teachers. We all want to go back to our normal lives, but not to the model for kids, but not at the expense of the health of our vulnerable kids and teachers. Children thrive in stable environments. The hybrid model is not a realistic model for kids to continue learning and for their social and emotional well-being. Now the kids know their teachers very well and teachers know and understand the needs of each of their students. Implementing a hybrid model will simply mean throwing away all these efforts. With a hybrid model, kids will be with different peers and would be seeing different teachers. Most parents and the majority of teachers, if not all of them, do not want the hybrid model. So please take these concerns into consideration. The COVID-19 cases are still increasing and we will stay in the purple tier for quite some time, which will get us closer to the end of the school year anyway. Thanks for listening to our concerns. Sincerely, Dr. Logna Rothenberg and Dr. Stefan Rothenberg. The next public comment reads, why are medical decisions being made by board members have a public health official and or doctor present? The trustees who have offered making decisions based on their own research need to reconsider how they make DJSD decisions in the future. It's important not to step out of your expertise as was on display tonight. Open as fast as the county guidelines allow, period. Best, Jeremy Taylor. The next board um, the next public comment reads to all board members never have I witnessed the pathetic ineptitude of any group in recent memory as I have with the DJSD school board. You are entirely paralyzed by the situation you have failed to plan for months and are destroying the community you serve. You sound smug and pompous you are ignoring science and ignoring facts. Your decisions are entirely based on fear when multiple examples exist of how to manage the situation. Your surveys look as if they were written and designed designed by a fifth grader, so nice job on wasting our time and money on that. You will look back on this period and realize that you have failed your community and the children you serve. We don't need perfect, we need an iterative plan that gets this process moving forward. With the way you work, it'll be 2022 before we make progress. Get the schools open. And that's from Simon Cronshaw. And the next comment reads, Dear educators, supporting staff, administrators, and board members, privilege is defined as a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. DGUSD has equity as one of its six core principles for reopening, but has failed to address privilege. Privilege is waiting until every single one of your demands have been met while expecting others to work in conditions you deem unsafe. Public health experts Experts have laid out an evidence-based guide to reopening that we have heard many in the district oppose again and again, even though the district has safely and effectively begun providing in-person services to some children. I would like to hear those opposed to opening describe to my child's daycare staff why it's okay for them to be around a cohort of masked, screened children every day, but it's not okay for DGUSD employees. I would like to hear those opposed to recommendations from public health officials explain to nurses, environmental services staff, Amazon workers, DoorDash employees and retail staff, why it's been okay for them to be working in the pandemic for a year, but many in the district are opposed to reopening in one of the most controlled and low risk environments that any employee could hope to work in. The great irony is that those who have been serving the community are most <clears throat> greatly affected by the school shutdown. My family is privileged. We can afford private daycare so that we can do our 
in-person essential jobs. We have not had to make the impossible choice between caring for our children and working, but we cannot educate them while we are at work. And as hard as they have tried, their teachers cannot adequately educate a five and seven year old. If we expect these children to be independent learners in front of a computer screen, we support teachers and their efforts at distance learning, but distance learning is a poor substitute for in-person education. This morning, we had our kindergartner start his iReady assessment at 630 AM so we could support him through it before it was time to go to work. I take the pandemic seriously. I am involved in it daily. I have seen my parents fewer than a handful of times in the past year. My colleagues and I have expended significant resources in helping those around us understand the severity of the pandemic and pleading with them to head the- 30 seconds. Heed, to heed the guidance of public health experts. All we are asking of you is to heed the guidance of public health experts and reopen for in-person learning when the public health targets have been reached. Harm is being caused. Respectfully, Andrew McDaniel, MD, parent of a DJUSD kindergartner and first grade, kindergarten and first grade students. And the next public comment comes from Michael Creedon. Trustees, we have listened to your meetings and heard your debate. We have heard our public health experts and pled our case. The vote taken on reopening condition in conditions Tuesday night was deeply disappointing. While I and many others strongly disagree, we nevertheless recognize that you acted on your elected, in your elected capacity. We do hope you will remain open to revisiting this topic and will stay abreast of the recommendations from public health experts, as well as state and federal government. While we respect that you have every right to vote as you wish, we hope you can appreciate that we have every right to continue to advocate for our children and to now take appropriate actions of our own in response. When the history of this pandemic is written, many will have much to explain. Many will claim they never wanted to closed schools or that they were too afraid to speak up. Some will claim they had they never heard about the science of safely opening schools. Many will deny children suffered any long-term harms, even when the evidence is put before them. Parents advocating for open schools, however, will sleep soundly having followed the guidance of experts. We just wish that our school board had as well. Mike Creedon. And the next comment um, comes from Roxanne Deutsch. Dear Board of Education trustees, thank you for your dedicated service during these difficult COVID times. Thank you for your recent decision to have teachers fully vaccinated before the anticipated return to school. Reopening schools without widespread vaccines and more scientific data is dangerous, is a dangerous and risky move. Tonight, I am writing about the proposed hybrid model draft for elementary, specifically the distance learning academy and the reassignment of all students to new teachers. Apparently in the elementary action teams, much time was spent trying to work out an in-person hybrid model not involving teaching both online and in-person at the same time as that model is unsustainable. However, this left little time to consider and discuss the Distance Learning Academy, and I learned from my colleagues that not everyone involved agreed on the final draft. Most concerning about the hybrid draft is that the families who chose, who choose to remain hold on, my, oops, sorry about that, who choose to remain safely in distance learning until their families can become vaccinated will have their children reassigned to a new teacher for the last few weeks of school. It is as, it is as if families that choose to remain safe will be punished. Primary grades focus on the development of the whole child. Please think about the social emotional health of these young students who will be torn apart from an important caregiver at the end of the school year. Will losing their teacher unexpectedly cause abandonment issues, create a lack of trust, or bring about more trauma and anxiety as their predictable routine is taken away? Teachers will not be fully vaccinated or likely ready to return until the end of April or the beginning of May. Therefore, as proposed in the last six weeks of, 
last six weeks of school, students will be uprooted, placed with a different teacher, have different classmates, possibly go to a different school, have different routines, a different canvas layout, different expectations, and a changed curriculum not in sync with their previous teacher. It is chaos and madness. Do parents or does the board really want this upheaval for our children? Elementary teachers daily address the mental health of our students. In district distance learning, we incorporate 30 minutes of daily SEL into our plans, have predictable, consistent routines, build a safe community, create trust, and are successful in preventing more trauma and emotional harm to children during seconds. this pandemic. We have a robust curriculum, cover all subjects, and are adhering to state standards. Students are learning and making academic growth as proven in the recent iReady diagnostic. Unlike the draft states, we offer up to 10.5 hours of live distance learning instruction plus asynchronous lessons. If we have to move to hybrid, there would not be enough hours in the day to maintain these high standards or continue to provide this robust curriculum as the workload would be doubled. Minutes. Our next public comment reads, I have four children in the district, second grade, seventh grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade, and I do not think this is a safe, effective, or sustainable plan. First, the timing of when this plan will be implemented just causes more confusion and concern. Once Yolo County reaches the red tier for two weeks, once all staff are fully vaccinated, switching classes and teachers with only months slash weeks left of school produces lack of continuity for both students and staff who have worked hard to connect with students. This is traumatic especially for elementary kids. Even in keeping cohorts as limited as possible, there is an exponential increased exposure due to siblings, parents, child care, etc. Will there really be adequate time for custodial staff to sanitize all classrooms between morning and afternoon? One cohort Monday to Tuesday, cleaning and sanitizing Wednesday, and the second cohort Thursday, Friday makes more sense for sanitizing and child care, transportation, and families with multiple children. And this only makes sense if we still need a hybrid model for next year. Like I said previously, all of this change for a month or two is not fair to our kids or to our teachers, not a trauma-informed approach at all. How will you enforce proper mask wearing and social distancing at all times? What happens if someone declines a COVID test? How will you ensure students do not attend school when sick or if exposed? Enforcement if a parent knowingly sends their child to school while sick or if exposed? Parents send their kids to school pre-COVID they send kids they know had head lice or other contagious things. What makes you think COVID-19 will be different? Parents on the parent boards are arguing. COVID are arguing COVID status is their privacy and they should be able to choose who knows and who doesn't. That doesn't sit well with me at all. What is the plan for ine inevitable COVID exposure, class and teacher quarantine for two weeks? What if subs are teaching the other cohort in person? I urge you to remain in distance learning format for the remainder of the 2021 school year and to focus your resources on opening schools for in-person learning for the 21-22 school year. Teachers have worked extremely hard to transition to an online format and to foster individual relationships with their students and switching students, teachers with more mere months, weeks left of school remaining would be traumatic. Thank you for hearing our voices. Jackie McNear. The next public comment reads, I was extremely disheartened to listen to the meeting last night, the 19th, and hear a strong tone that returning to in-person is not a priority for our kids. The discussion appeared to ignore the science and testimony that education in person is not just an essential service, but a fundamental service. I saw the standards discussed to be impossible to achieve and put education a lower priority than outdoor dining in terms of standards of opening. Additionally, I found the edits to paragraph two about a return to school standards non-logical to, to implement. How can you have two-week waiting period after the vaccines are offered? How will you track that? Can a single teacher refuse to be vaccinated and therefore preclude the entire district from returning? I appreciate how much time is being spent to find the right answer. And as a child of a teacher myself, I understand and appreciate all of the efforts for safety for all. I commend you on your civil and kind discussions. However, I feel that the current approach tips the scale beyond what the science requires to the detriment of the children. I ask you to consider education as an essential service and to treat it as such. Daniela Almeida. The next public comment reads, Dear DGSD Board, if one considers first the safety and health of students, teachers, staff, and the community of Davis, then it is not a difficult decision to decide when to bring students back. The SARS-CoV is more transmissible and it's more 
transmissible variants are dangerous and are killing Davis citizens. Please read the short article about the most recent information regarding schools and the CV-19 transmission. In a nutshell, quote, children are a considerable factor in the spread of COVID-19. The problem is not that schools are unsafe for children. The problem is schools act as vectors for transmission, causing the virus to spread between households from the Wall Street Journal, and the link is included. Multiple vaccines are being rolled out and administered right now. If you, the DGSD board, would look beyond the emotional arguments and consider the data, then it is irresponsible and careless to bring students back for in-person schooling until the vaccines have done their job. Hold your course. It's the correct course of action. Protect the lives and the future health of our families. It's an easy decision. Robert Enzerink. The next comment reads, Dear board members, my name is Nelia Sperka, and my family and I live in Davis. My son is in third grade and is homeschooled through the Davis School for Independent Study. Prior to this year, he attended Korematsu Elementary School. For several reasons, including the pandemic and the uncertainty over the format of traditional education for the 2020-21 school year, my husband and I decided to homeschool him. Since both of us work from home, it was the best decision for us. I understand and respect that every DJUSD family has a different set of circumstances and needs. And I understand that the district is doing what it can to address these needs within the limitations brought on by the pandemic. Moreover, I understand that in-person learning is the best option for students, especially for students with special needs and low-income students. However, I believe that in order for in-person school, including a hybrid option, to be successful, there should be a be broad access to the COVID-19 vaccine for all school employees and clear guidance as to when the vaccinated employees can return to school. Before schools are reopened for in-person learning, we urge you to work with local health health officials to provide vaccines to all school employees and guidance to ensure that teachers and students can return to classrooms safely and successfully. Thank you for your time and consideration. Nelia Sperka. Pardon, hold on. And the next comment reads, Dear DJUSD School Board, I would like to commend DJUSD for making the health and safety of students, faculty, and the community a priority while navigating distance learning. I truly appreciate the amount of effort that has gone into helping students and their families navigate these unprecedented, uncertain, and unsafe times. The DJUSD faculty and staff have gone above and beyond to learn new new technology and engage the students. This year has been challenging for everyone. This is not how anyone want school to look like, but I am gravely concerned for the students, faculty, families, and the community of DJUSD if DJUSD implements a hybrid in-person program. Due to the extremely contagious and deadly COVID-19 virus, DJUSD must listen to science and err on the side of caution. By opening schools, the community's risk of spreading COVID increases. The media has reported other school districts that implemented a hybrid return to school model with the region have documented a co- have documented COVID-19 cases amongst students and staff. The hybrid model should be postponed until mass distribution of the vaccine is available. The health and safety of students and our community should remain a priority. I also question the academic improvement that the hybrid model will achieve over distant learning. I am aware of claims that there is a loss of social interaction and academic learning. I question how the social interaction among students and in other districts have improved Improved if safety measures are maintained. I would imagine the hours in school would be dramatically reduced and interaction will be limited. Moreover, how can a child or teacher focus on a class lesson if there is concern about maintaining safety in a class setting? What research supports that hybrid model? The hybrid model is an improvement, if at all, over the distance learning, distant learning model. From a personal standpoint, the disruption of implementing a hybrid model could make the learning experience even more dire. My son looks forward to seeing his teacher every school day. He continues to show up on Zoom and do his schoolwork because of the caring relationship that his teacher has built with him. Now in the middle of this school year, he may be assigned to a new teacher. He has lost his ability to play with his friends, participate in group projects, celebrate special school-wide events. The loss of his teacher would would be devastating to him. 
DJOC must take a stance and not follow the suit of other districts that have implemented a hybrid model this academic year. The risk of je jeopardizing the health and well-being of seconds. students, staff, and community is far greater than the unproven belief that returning to school, appending the current routine for a limited in-person learning experience will significantly improve a student's academic and social needs. Sincerely, Ryan Ong, DJUSD parent. The next comment reads, Dear School Board, thank you for your extra, hold on one sec, please. Thank you for your extra efforts and careful consideration of the practical and safe return to a hybrid or in-person instruction for the Davis K-12 aged students. This letter is to express my support for returning small cohorts to school as soon as possible with COVID testing widely available and new financial support from the governor's office. I see no reason to delay this return. Our children are the ones who are paying for each minute that we don't come up with and implement a plan to return to the school campus. I have read that the school board has concerns in how in-person instruction would exacerbate inequities and equal access to education. Currently, many families in Davis are coping with rem remote education by hiring tutors, therapists, extra extracurricular activities, sports, music. Some families are paying a lot to supplement all that is missing from their child's education. Clearly, this is not true for all families. What is happening for families who can't afford a tutor, therapist, babysitter, and the rest? How is our current model any more equitable than one where they can return to campus? Public health experts, including Dr. Fauci, have laid out an evidence-based guide to reopening that we have heard many in the district oppose again and again, even though the district has safely and effectively begun providing in-person services to some children. I am in support of returning to school and doing so in a way that is safe, creative, and reimagined. Hybrid, yes. Required of everyone, no. Allow the students and teachers who want to return to come back. Allow teachers to Zoom to their classroom from off-site, the NPR, the schoolyard, or recruit Davis families to build a plexiglass box for each teacher to feel safe. This town is full of innovation and investment from committed parents, teachers, and the greater community. Please plan now so that when we move to the red tier and begin the countdown to count down the days that we can look forward to a return to the classroom. I think it would give so much hope to Davis families and it would align with the recommendations and guidelines that are being successfully implemented in neighboring communities. And that comment came from Lori San Martin. Okay, and our next comment reads, Dear members of the Davis Board of Education, I'm writing today to express my concern after listening to multiple Board of Education meetings. After each meeting, I find myself thinking, if other high quality public school districts can do it, what is preventing DJSD from presenting a return to school plan based on public health metrics and recommendations? What is so different about Davis and why is the school board making these decisions without a public health expert at the meeting? I also resent that the school board has insinuated that in-person learning would exasperate the equity gap. This could could not be further from the truth. I work in medicine, and when we observe patients unable to access care, we don't separate them more from the medical establishment to protect them. We find ways to bring them to the care and deliver more. That is how you close equity gaps. My own children are able to manage distance learning from technical standpoint. From the technical standpoint, I have observed, however, in the light of their the light of their eyes is gone. They turn in assignments because they are due, sometimes without fully understanding the material. I see their desire to learn, excel, and achieve mastery disappearing as each week passes. Every single teacher has provided them with support they need when they reach out. But they are tired, depressed, and without hope. I no longer worry about the learning loss because I can't. I am singularly focused on their mental and emotional health. No, I don't want to compromise anyone's safety. I'm not advocating to force any teacher or staff member who is high risk back on campus. I'm a physician working in healthcare and highly aware of how to mitigate risks. We are 11 months into this pandemic and there are tested and available ways to reduce risk and viral spread. And as the vaccine becomes available to teachers, there will be an additional layer of protection. And after three, after the 
three January Board of Education meetings, I am truly worried that our children will not return to campus as what I perceived was an unwillingness to listen to the scientific evidence, make rational, non-fear-based decisions, lay out a written plan with metrics, goals, and contingencies. Our young people's lives depend on us getting this right. Their physiological brain structure is changing in response to isolation, excessive scream time, angst, and fear. This is not a small matter. This is permanently affecting the generation who we need to lead us to better days. I respectfully call upon the board to present their plan for the return to campus, even if it begins in the spring, or explain to the public that you serve why you cannot present this and what makes Davis different. Seconds. You... Sorry, my screen just flashed. You are elected to serve the public, leading with decisions based on science, not on personal opinion. Thank you for the time. Thank you for taking the time to read this and for allowing the public comment and, part and to participate. Sincerely, Shanaz Hazel. Okay, our next public comment reads, two comments on the proposed DGSD hybrid teaching model, which I understand will be voted on tomorrow. Our son is a first grader at Montgomery. One, we are very keen to see him return to in-person instruction. Two, your priority surely must be to obtain and if possible require vaccinations for teachers. After that, return to regular in-person instruction. I don't understand the upside of this hybrid model. Either teachers are vaccinated, in which case proceed to, as, to business as usual, or they're not, in which case this model looks precarious. The hybrid approach looks enormously complex and resource intensive. That comment comes from Stefan H. Ulig. The next comment reads, Dear Board and staff, can we please get specifics and updates on DJSD expected timeline and the process for administering two doses of the vaccine to teachers? I imagine and hope the district is lobbying to secure those doses for teachers ASAP so we can reopen and move to hybrid in spring. Before, below is the response I received from the PIO at Yolo County as I'm requesting transparency regarding this. Since this board has identified this condition, as a condition for reopening. Although this requirement when we're in the red tier is unique to Davis and not one of the experts are recommending once allowed to open in red tier using mitigation me measures. I, can, I am concerned this condition will keep schools shut for the remainder of the year. I hope it is not a hidden agenda. Response from the Yellow County PIO when I requested transparency of DJSD slash county plan. And quote, yes, the county is working with DGSD on the vaccination process. However, the specific requirement for students or staff from DGSD is theirs. The timeline is still up in the air and we are not yet in phase 1B and still need many more vaccine doses from the state. And that email comes from Monique Garcia Gunther. The next comment comes from Jessica Jacobson, Dear Board of Education members and Superintendent Bose, in the last board meeting I heard mention of equity in regard to a rather trivial matter, the possibility of providing some in-person extracurricular activities staffed by non-teachers. I'm wondering if you think about the following inequities. The inequity of <clears throat> as special needs children who have not had their needs effectively met for close to a year who have been floundering without support, the inequity of low income families who are forced to choose between their livelihoods and their children's educations, the inequity of families unable to provide full support to young learners, unable to navigate the online systems alone and in many cases unable to read, the inequity of families who speak a different language at home than the language of instruction and are unable to support their children, the inequity of women taking on the substantial share of the burden of closed schools and the negative impact on their careers, employment, earnings, and independence, the inequity of school schedules and material pickup times that are in the middle of standard of the standard workday, making it challenging for working parents to arrange transportation, the inequity of students who are left home alone or in poor supervision because their parents need to work, the inequity of students who are in abusive environments and have no one to look out for them or report suspected abuse, the inequity of students who can manage their own Zoom experiences being brought back to campus before students who need assistance, the inequity of students who are failing, the inequity of students whose lifetime earnings and lifetime health prospects have been negatively affected by dropping out 
disengagement or underperformance due to services not meeting their needs, the inequity of students who are depressed and anxious and suicidal, the inequity of students living in a state ranked 37th for K-12 public education pre-pandemic, receiving far fewer live instructional minutes than other states using remote learning, putting these students on a fast track toward the bottom of national rankings, the inequity that when the district fails to serve students, those who are able will find other solutions, but it be it educational or extracurricular, while those who are unable are left without. The inequity that closed schools have disproportionate negative impacts on racial minorities and low-income families. The inequity that student lifespan decreases with each week that school seconds. is closed, with the most disadvantaged students losing the most expected lifespan. When you talk, so when you talk about equity in extracurriculars, it rings hollow because you are not focusing on equity where it counts with people's lives, lifespans, economic status, and mental well-being. You are not acknowledging that extended school closure is likely the greatest blow to our to equity our children will experience in our lifetime. If you really care that about equity. Minutes. Okay. The next comment. comes from Amy Hiss. Dear Board of Education, there is no perfect option for reopening our schools until students and staff are vaccinated. We all want schools to be back to normal, but realistically, normal is months out. Forcing students and teachers back now won't get us quote, back to normal, end quote, for several reasons. First, it isn't just about keeping kids safe. How are we supposed to keep teachers and staff safe? We are already short experienced teachers. Teachers would opt out. Many would have to for safety. And the reality is we would end up with classrooms being taught by rotating a rotating mix of subs who we couldn't even get before the pandemic. Paraeducators or volunteers, and I'm grateful for them all. But that would be a logistical and staffing nightmare with a huge energy suck, confusing for the kids. And I don't see how that's all that helpful with regard to the social and emotional support and academic learning. Routine and structure are important to kids. Please don't make kids get all new classroom teachers now. We've invested substantial time and resources to make online education as good as it can be with some limited supports for students that need them most. Let's not break that model. Let's expand on that. That model by one increasing support to our neediest students and two engaging and supporting students socially and emotionally by holding PE and or sports practices outdoors after online school in small cohorts. Uh, all of our kids are suffering now. I see it in my own kid every day, but the degree of suffering is truly great in some children. These groups include homeless children, foster youth, those lacking internet, kids that don't have parents that can work at home to help, and those experiencing emotional or mental health crises. These children urgently need our help and resources. My kid is suffering too, and he's in, in a special needs group, but honestly, he can limp along for a few more months and be most, most okay. You know who else is suffering? Our teachers. They are not okay. Please support them. Older children, junior high and high school, may transmit the virus much like adults. Schools reopening for this cohort may be more dangerous. There are new virus variants in play that may be more transmissible and we just don't know enough about them. If we hang on until fall for a vaccine rollout, we can efficiently return without inefficient seconds. and distressing stops and starts like other districts are having to do. Closures with new outbreaks and impacts on ICU capacity and driving away already scarce teachers and staff. Lawsuits on this matter do not help the district. Paying for lawyers l just takes away funds that could be going to our kids. Please be brave enough to stay on course until fall. Increase supports and in-person school for small cohorts. Three minutes. Okay. And the next comment comes from Lauren Crownshaw. Dear Board of Education, 
comments regarding the conditions to return to campus. I'd like to thank Trustee Heider for her comments and perspective voiced during the meeting on Tuesday, January 19th. It was striking that she alone supported the advice from experts and public health officials, including Dr. Sisson, regarding the criteria required for a safe return to school. I appreciate Trustee Heider's acknowledgement that the public health officials are the true experts and their opinions should be respected. Why do the remaining trustees ignore scientific research opinions from experts and public health officials? The four trustees who voted aye to the return criteria have set the standard to return higher than necessary when compared to recommended by public health officials and experts. This does a grave disservice to our students and our community by needlessly delaying when our students can return to campus. Your job is a trustee is not to determine what is safe and what is not safe. That is the job of public health officials and experts. It is your job to take that information and help our district get students back in school as soon as possible. The public health officials do not say that vaccines for teachers is a requirement for a safe return to school. Are you saying that you know better than them? Comments regarding extracurricular, co-curricular, and outdoor curricular activities. The board needs to focus on solutions rather than putting up roadblocks. If there are concerns about equity among some among extracurricular, co-curricular, and curricular outdoor opportunities on campus, then the focus should be on how to how to creatively make these equitable. Trustee Dara, I heard you talk about your concerns and what you viewed as problems, but I did not hear you once be a creative leader and propose solutions. In closing, we need leaders who will put in the effort and bring the community together. We do not need trustees who will sit back and wait for their unnecessarily high return standards to be met. I know that going back hybrid will not be easy, but that does not mean it is not worth fighting for. Be the board that we need, respectfully, parent of first and second grade students. Our next comment reads, first, let me express my gratitude for your time, care, and consideration in developing a safe reopening plan. Your decisions earlier this week demonstrate that the health and safety of teachers, staff, students, and families is a priority. I have been a secondary special education teacher in DJSD for 12 years. I am also a DJSD parent to a preschool student and a young elementary student attending DJSD schools. I first want to say that attempting to process all three of these hybrid schedules in about a day has been a hustle. I hope that you will take the time to process them further and gather more feedback on these schedules and not rush to approve them today. In looking at all three schedules, my biggest concern are with the elementary schedule. That's not to say I don't have concerns with the preschool or secondary schedules, but I only have three minutes. My big, my first big concern with the elementary model is having both cohorts attend on the same day. I'd like to know how this does not result in elementary teachers doubling their current workload. From where I'm sitting, elementary teachers are already moving mountains with the caliber of teaching they are providing, doubling their workload, which also drastically cuts down their prep time while reducing overall instructional minutes with students is simply put not good enough. We have been able to do much better than that, or it's not worth reopening. My even larger concern is that elementary school students will be made to shuffle teachers if they stay in distance learning, or perhaps if they don't, depending on the numbers. My daughter's in first grade at MME. Her teacher has worked so hard to build classroom community and make incredible progress with them in their academic skills and language development, not to mention at a time in my daughter's life when she's isolated from her friends and family, her teacher has become a beloved and trusted role model in her life, who she looks forward to seeing every day. She was the first person my daughter told that her uncle had passed away. Think about that for a moment. Now you're telling me for the sake of simply being on campus, there's a good chance you'll have to switch teachers over halfway through the year. This is going, this goes against everything we know about social emotional best practices for kids, especially young kids. This will absolutely further disrupt student learning and cause additional unnecessary trauma to kids who are already living through a pandemic. I cannot belabor my disappointment in this piece of proposal in this piece of the proposal enough. It is the last thing we should be doing to our young students right now. More time and work is needed to figure out a manageable way to address the many concerns of hybrid without potential upheaval to student learning and relationships. 
My biggest plea to you today is that you absolutely should not vote to approve these schedules today, the same day they're being presented to you, less than 48 hours after they've made it available to the public. Teachers and parents need more time. You need more time to process the huge implications of these schedules before you move forward with any version. Thanks to you and your solid decision making, we are not reopening right away. We have the time to get this right. I sincerely hope you will take them, take the time to do so. Thank you for all you do. Be safe and take good care. Kristen Yulias. The next comment reads, Dear esteemed board members, I'd like to thank you again for your tireless dedication and consider and careful consideration of the monumental tasks of figuring out exactly what being in school will look like once we go back in person. I would like to thank you for making the decision to go back once teachers have been vaccinated and our county has been in the red zone for two weeks. I do have some concerns about the model that is currently being proposed. First, my understanding is that Distance Learning Academy will be implemented as the distance learning option. This will not work for Cesar Chavez students. We are a choice school with a unique Spanish immersion model, and it simply will not work for students who attend Chavez to be moved to learning from a teacher who is not teaching in Spanish. Teachers at CCE have specialized training and are able to deliver lessons that are true to our model. This will be impossible to do if students are in the distance learning academy. The model being proposed currently states that one person from each grade level team will be teaching distance learning and the others will be in person. There are three teachers on the CCE kindergarten team and we have been splitting the work of teaching distance learning three ways. Doing this model would mean that the person who's teaching distance learning would have the workload of three teachers. Three teachers could still plan together, but the workload would be tremendous. Also, it is extremely detrimental to kindergarten students to change teachers mid-year. Kindergarten students are still learning how to be in school and what it means in terms of behavior, expectations, social expectations, schedules, and routines. It takes very long time to get a five-year-old to you used to these routines. If kindergarten students were to have to change their teacher, they would have to spend more time learning new routines and expectations from a new teacher. This would take away significant amounts of learning time. Related to this is the fact that we'll be spending so much of the teaching expectations about COVID, six feet apart, frequent hand washing, mask requirements, temperature checks, etc., that there will be not much time for learning. This problem is compounded by the fact that kindergarten students only attend school half day. These reasons lead me to advocate for the following model. Students who are attending school in person would come in the morning and students attending online would attend in the afternoon. If this were implemented, the entire grade level, for example, kindergarten at CCE, and then the three teachers could still share the workload. This would mean that students who would continue attending school online would continue to receive the amount and quality of instruction that they are currently receiving. The students who attend in person would also receive the same high quality of instruction. If one person is responsible for all of the distance learning instruction, Instruction, these students will not receive the same instruction. 30 seconds. Thank you for taking the time to read this letter. Again, I truly appreciate the work you're doing to ensure that when our school goes back in person, we will all have a safe, reasonable working environment. Sincerely, Rachel McLemore, kindergarten teacher at CCE. <clears throat> the next letter comes to us from Diane and Scott McElhern. We are the parents of a fifth grader at Pioneer and a sophomore at Davis High School. We remain both perplexed and quite worried about the school board's inability to make the right decisions for all of the children who attend the schools in our school district. With the exception of one forward-thinking school board member, thank you, Betsy Heider, all of you have illogically supported passing possible school reopening plans that are more restrictive than those proposed by Governor Newsom for the state of California, AB 10, the National Pediatrics Association, and President Biden. In particular, the requirement of mass vaccinations for all returning teachers will result in no in-person schooling this academic year. On Wednesday, January 20th, 2021, state epidemic Demiologist Dr. Erica Pan stated that it could take the state of California four to five months to vaccinate the 1B tier, which includes those 65 as older and older as well as teachers. Why is it that when we walk past one of the many private schools in Davis and the county of Loyola, we see the school children happily playing on the playgrounds at recess and safely attending in-person school? And right across the street from one private school in Davis, the entire Davis Senior 
high school and North elementary schools remain closed and locked up as tight as drums. Public schools throughout the Sacramento region are also open to in-person learning. We have friends in El Dorado County whose children attend elementary school five days a week in a hybrid setting. How is that how is it that private schools and other local public school districts can safely reopen for in-person instruction and maintain a healthy environment, but the Davis Joint Unified School District can't even design a plausible reopening plan that is based on science instead of illogical fear? The Davis Joint Unified School District, once the gem of Davis, has failed its most valuable and vulnerable population, our children. We do not want to have to pull our children from the district schools and place them in private school, but we may be left with no choice unless the school district can reopen sometime this spring. In addition, we cannot even imagine that the school district would entertain a plan that could potentially delay the reopening of our schools in the fall of 2021. Are you really going to propose a plan that keeps our schools closed until sometime in 2022? or beyond. Please listen to science, our governor and our new president, and adopt a reasonable plan for reopening our schools in the spring of 2020. Thank you, Diane and Scott McElhern. The next letter comes from Brooke Burns. I am a parent of a sixth grader at a sixth grade student at Patwin Elementary and an eighth grade student at Emerson Junior High School. I write to urge the board to continue making decisions that prioritize student, teacher, and community health and safety that are based on sound science and data. Rather than util utilizing already strained resources to rush a return to school in the spring, I ask that the board focus on ensuring that we have shored up the resources, e.g. proper PEE, PPE, air filters, teachers, vaccinations, testing resources to plan for a safe return to school in the fall. Many families, including ours, will not be able to send their children back to in-person learning until at the very least, the adults in their household are vaccinated. I know that you are well aware that the decisions you make will inevitably make a difference between life and death for people living in our community. Please count me among the many parents who support your actions regarding distance learning thus far. Thank you for your service to our community, Brooke Burns. The next comment comes from Alyssa Liska. I am writing to again implore you to open our schools. The science continues to be clear. Our children are suffering. Schools should be open. The blatant disregard for facts and science in this board's decision on if or when to reopen schools is so disheartening. You clearly have no intention of getting students back into the classroom this year. It reminds me of a certain recently departed administration that refused to acknowledge facts, refused to trust science, shame on you. You are surrounded by families and struggling with distance learning, yet you refuse to acknowledge them. I am relatively new to Davis due to a job relocation, and I was looking forward to being part of a, such a well-respected school district. Now I'm just embarrassed. Alyssa, mother of a kindergartner. The next public comment reads, members of the board, we feel compelled to write this letter because we're confused, anxious, and frustrated by your decisions regarding the reopening of Davis schools. We have a unique perspective regarding this issue because we have an eighth grader at Harper Junior High and a fourth grader at St. James School. My fourth grader has been back on campus since October. We were concerned and nervous when the school announced they were reopening, but after reviewing their approved return to campus protocols, we decided to have him return to campus. The school continues to tweak the rules based on community spread. They send surveys after the holi each holiday and provide distance learning for anyone who traveled or, needed or needs to quarantine. Drop off and pick up are staggered by grades and parents do not leave their car. And when a case of COVID was discovered, they follow their protocols and no other cases were discovered. And while the school looks very different than it did pre-COVID-19, the safety measures they have in place work and our son is happy and excited to go to school every day. The school, the diocese and the county has ensured that this essential service this essential and fundamental need of educating students is done in a safe environment. They have proven it can be done. 
In stark contrast, our eighth grader continues to sit in his bedroom or at the kitchen table day after day distance learning. While we applaud the teachers for their effort, the DJSD is providing our children is not an education. It is dismal at best, the very minimal standards the district can get away with providing. Our eighth grader should be on campus in a constructive, energetic learning environment that challenges his mind and makes him want to strive to do better. Sitting at home with no interaction with other students his age does not provide this dynamic. <clears throat> academic and social environment he needs, and quite honestly, what DJSD should strive to provide all of its students. With the exception of one member, board member, all of you have illogically supported passing possible passing possible school reopening plans that are more restrictive than those pro proposed by Governor Newsom for the state of California, AB 10, the National PDA Pediatrics Association and, the, and President Biden. In particular, the requirement of mass vaccinations for all returning teachers will result in no in-person schooling this academic year. On Wednesday, January 20th, 2021, state ep epidemiologist Dr. Erica Pan stated it could take the state of California four to five months to vaccinate the 1B tier, which includes those 65 and older, as well as teachers. You, Davis Joint Unified School District, has failed its most valuable and vulnerable population, our children are you really going to consider a plan that will delay the reopening of in-person instruction in seconds. fall 2021 and possibly keep our schools closed until sometime in 2022 shame on you if that is how you vote shame on you for not working towards an equitable solution for all involved and shame on you for focusing on what you can't do rather than what all of us collectively can do together we sincerely hope you review the science and the data study current models that work and put the needs of davis students first as you move forward with a plan for getting students back to where they belong in the classroom steve and patty sosa the next Comment reads, Dear board members, I request that we wait a little longer to reopen schools when the community is fully vaccinated, ensuring my safety and that we do not attempt the hybrid model. The benefits of the hybrid model do not outweigh the adverse effects detailed below. One of the perceived benefits of the hybrid model is the efficacy of teaching. Currently, teaching is more effective under distance learning. First, returning would be disruptive on multiple levels. We invested a lot of time and effort into Canvas and distance teaching. We spent months creating an academic culture of inclusiveness in our virtual classrooms. If we return, the students and teachers will be shuffled. These new classrooms will feel like the beginning of the school year again. But this time in April, what are the social emotional benefits of a classroom where everyone is masked, students cannot have recess, move around the room, or even go to the bathroom on demand? What are the academic benefits when students cannot participate in small group learning? Teachers cannot walk over to the desk to watch students and teachers and students are in class fewer hours each day. In my virtual classroom, I currently have more direct instructional time than if we go hybrid. Online, my class meets and works 8.30 to noon and then 12.30 to 1.15. Students have small groups and office hours. If you change the schedule for hybrid, students will be getting less direct instruction time, resulting in more independent time. Also, resource time currently scheduled after my AM direct instruction will interfere with instructional time, handicapping those students who need the teacher the most. Another perceived benefit is kids being outside of the home. I don't feel I can safely teach in the current physical environment for a few reasons. First, my physical classroom is an old temporary building with poor ventilation. I have mold and mildew in my room. Secondly, all safety precautions state that people who are indoors need to stay six feet apart. Even only teaching half my class, my room cannot accommodate 12 to 15 students six feet apart. I understand a group of parents who want the schools to reopen are pushing hard, but is it safe? Will the majority of students even come back with the vaccine so close and the county is moving them from, moving from red to purple? Tier, do parents really understand that school will not be what it was like in March before the lockdown? I don't think they do. I appreciate the district is taking a slow approach to reopening while other districts have opened only to close again. Let's take a page from the other colleges and just make this whole year distance learning slash teaching. We are doing so. We are so close to getting the vaccine. We have the systems and relationships established. Let's finish out the school year keeping kids, ourselves, and our families safe and healthy. Karen Luke, fifth grade, North Davis Elementary. The next comment reads, Dear DJSD Board of Trustees, as you consider hybrid models this evening, I respectfully ask you to consider that student-teacher familiarity plays a huge role in educating our children. As an elementary teacher in this district, I personally am more concerned about the proposal to assign elementary students to another cohort slash teacher. The foundation of any classroom is always relationships. 
This pandemic has rewritten the syllabus for the 2021 school year. Life has hit my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade Montessori students from all directions, health, relationships, school obligations, family issues, and even the death of a loved one. These are external stressful situations that, I, that they and I have no control over. However, my consistency, structure, problem solving, and care are the calming safe haven during these times of stress. Children, especially younger ones or anxious kids, benefit from knowing what's going to happen and when their teacher is always there for them. My modeling of healthy internal response to what life deals us is one of the best ways I know how to build resilience, which is one of DJSD graduate profile goals. The upfront investment into relationships is helping each of the 50 kiddos I work with daily feel safe, heard, loved, and understood. Every situation is unique and establishes relation. Every situation is unique and establishes relationships, helps kids take risks, make mistakes, and feel safe. The development of inner strength does not happen overnight. I urge you to consider that aspect of the proposed elementary cohorts distance learning academy and how the possibility of this late stage in the school year would dramatically affect our youngest learners. I want to thank my DJSD colleagues who diligently worked on trying to come up with realistic proposals for your consideration. I thank you too. This is not an easy path. However, I and my and many elementary teachers sincerely feel starting elementary students in a new cohort or distance learning academy with a new teacher would emotionally harm our elementary students. Regards, Sally Palo Birch Lane Elementary. The next comment comes from Rachel Kitazono. Dear board members, I'm writing again in hopes that you will take into consideration the seriousness of extended school closures. You cannot deny the inequity that this imposes on our community. Those with means go elsewhere and generally do better than those without means. Research shows that the long-term consequences of school closure is vast, including lower lifespans, economic status, and physical and mental well-being and real consequences are being experienced now. Some of your most needy and vulnerable students are still not receiving any in-person services. Yes, you have provided some assistance to the few, but you need to do more. There has been mention of favoring the status quo because it allows for maintaining current schedules and routine. This argument holds no merit for keeping schools closed. Families have had endless upheaval to manage this new norm of learning by a screen. The schedules of distance learning have not been easy to accommodate for parents from the start, yet we've had no other choice. Keeping students out of school because it's a scheduling inconvenience is unconscionable and harmful. To say students cannot change teachers is also a lousy excuse to keep schools shuttered. The dis disruption students have had to their lives is immeasurable, and to attend school with an in-person teacher would be a blessing and a positive light for them. Many are already changing out already and jumping to private schools anyway. There is mention of simply adding some school-sanctioned extracurricular activities, but this does not address the tremendous academic issues and struggles our children face, which should be of paramount, paramount importance. In-person instruction of any kind would be helpful, but does not come closest to substituting for in-person school, which can often better assist with the children's social, emotional, and behavioral needs. <clears throat> As the superintendent, Alberto, um, Carvalho of the Miami-Dade School District noted, schools are indispensable safe harbors for children academically, physically, and emotionally, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Recognizing, recognizing how important this is, this school district of more than 350,000 students has kept their schools open. In-person school can be done safely. Our own county public health officer, Dr. Sisson, noted this at the last board meeting while also saying that quote, education is fundamental, end quote, indicating seconds. there's no reason to not open schools once in red tier. However, now the discussion has shifted to vaccinations. This is a great endeavor, and I support any and all efforts to continue to vaccinate teachers and staff. However, you must continue to rely on public health experts about when schools should start opening or already be open. It is a great public health risk to continue to keep schools closed, which is why top leaders and officials are urging safe reopenings Include three minutes. Okay. The next public comment comes from 
Renee Neal. Dear Dr. Bose and DJ USD board members, thank you for all of the time and energy you continue to put into this discussion and for listening to the educators. I understand how difficult these decisions are and I do not envy your position. There are a few reasons that reopening, including with a hybrid model, would pose serious health, health risks that outweigh the benefits. The health risks to the children in a hybrid system are twofold. First, children develop a dangerous complication from COVID called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Children also show high level viral loads while remaining asymptomatic. Screening for COVID symptoms would not necessarily necessarily mean that kids did not possess the infection, therefore being able to spread the infection. Secondly, children infected at school could bring COVID home to their parents who may have, have significant health challenges themselves or are taking care of older relatives at a higher risk. If something happened to a parent or older relative, the horror of losing a family member is less than the life altering guilt of a child feeling he or she brought the disease home. The benefit of hybrid education, on the other hand, is misunderstood. These stated benefits include the social interaction of children, the educational impact, less screen time, and for some students, a safer environment during the day. The first benefit, social, intera social interaction, fails to address students' limited social interaction. Students must stay six feet away from each other in the classroom, something not feasible in our current classrooms, masked without having any recess time. These requirements negate all social interaction benefits. In contrast, kids engaged in distance learning can see others' faces, including their teacher. Online children often laugh together, act in silly ways, and make funny faces, not only in the younger grades. A masked, distanced, fearful environment is not advantageous. Secondly, students currently receive more instructional time in distance learning than they would in the classroom. My fifth grade team, my sixth grade daughter, and my second grade daughter are are all in class synchronously between the hours of 8.30 and noon most days. In addition, teachers offer afternoon assistance from 30 minutes to an hour or more during office hours or other That's forms of instruction. This is significantly more time than the kids would receive in the hybrid model of three hours. I acknowledge that students would have less screen time if on campus, but this is secondary to the other concerns. Finally, students who are unsafe or unsuccessful at home have the option of joining the cohorts for parents who feel comfortable with in-person learning. Despite the school offering this service to the neediest of students, most of the families declined the offer due to health Three risks. Minutes. Thank you. And the next comment comes from Molly Aline. To all those concerned, why? Why on earth does Davis make everything so difficult? Why? This hybrid learning calendar that is going around with half days and models is absolutely crazy. How? How on earth is any working parent supposed to deal with this? We are already struggling. Everyone is struggling. Teachers, my heart breaks even more for you. Why, Davis, why can't the hybrid model follow what every school district is doing or proposing? Why can't it be half the class goes to school learning goes to school learning Monday and Thursday and the other half on Tuesday and Friday and Wednesday is Zooming for all? On the days kids are home distance learning, they have work to complete. Why isn't this an option? This works for so many schools. This is better for working parents. It gives us a small chance of actually getting some form of normal. Now the reality is we are suffering with distance learning. We battle, we are stressed out, we cry weekly over school. This isn't a way to learn. We all know this though. We are all suffering to a point. Today I overheard my second grader and her class talking with the school counselor. I sat on the floor and cried. The kids are scared. The kids are scared their friends won't remember them. They are scared their families are going to die. They are scared COVID-19 will never go away. They, these are the words I heard the seven-year-old say, my heart aches. Why? Why would we make the children go back when it isn't safe yet? Do we really want to add more anxiety to their lives? Schools should not be open in any form until every form, until every teacher and staff is 
vaccinated. I want nothing more than to get back to some form of normalcy. My children need it, but it isn't. if it isn't safe, then it shouldn't even be addressed. I hope the district rethinks the impossible hybrid model and timing for return. Don't make it hard. Don't overthink it. Don't have committee after committee think about this. Make it simple for the fall when hopefully all teachers and staff will have been vaccinated. Molly Aline. The next comment reads, Dear Board, we request that you open DJ schools at once. Yolo County has been in the red tier. Well, oh, sorry. We request you reopen DJSD schools once Yolo County has been in the red tier for two weeks as proposed by Betsy Hyder on Tuesday night. Here are the real stories of our DJSD children and how they're handling distance learning. Child one just put a hamper over their head because they cannot deal with the emotional stress on being on another Zoom call. Child two is crying because they have fear of being on camera. Child three is holding it together just long enough to get through their Zoom calls, but becomes an emotional mess when the calls are over. Child four is begging their parents to go back to school where learning was fun. Child five went from straight A student to being depressed much of the time and has fallen behind on her homework. Child six went to her mother with tears in her eyes last week asking for a math tutor. She attends the extra office hours but still doesn't understand. She has to be back in school where she can ask more questions and see the board better. Child seven has dyslexia and has absolutely no services. He was reading at grade level prior to the pandemic but just seven months in just seven months, he's now reading up to two grades behind level. This will impact his preparation for middle school. Child eight is 13 years old and has gained 60 pounds since the pandemic. A real PE class five days a week would have kept that off of her. Child nine is 16 years old. She breaks down and gets angry so easily now. Prior to school closing, she had all A's, loved school, and her friends. Our children need to be back in school as soon as possible. Their futures depend on it. Thank you. And that came from Heather Jones. Next comment reads, members of the board, with nearly six months left in school, there are many reasons to be optimistic that a full return to campus will be possible and successful. Why hasn't there been more optimistic tone and a more of a can-do attitude during the meetings given the body of information we have now? We have vaccines, diminishing transmission rates, rapid testing capability, and data from safely safely open schools. As of yesterday, positivity and case rates in California had dropped and that and this is expected to continue with additional immunity and improved weather. See link one. With this in mind, let's have a growth mindset and plan for the best case scenario. Open schools around the world in open schools around the world in the US and locally provide more reasons to be optimistic. Neighboring school districts such as Ro Roseville, Rockland, Folsom Cordova, Eureka, Napa, Marin among others, successfully opened in the fall. But within the county and in Davis, private schools are thriving with basic practices such as masking, distancing, and ventilation. District buildings without significant modifications are currently being utilized by Kit Davis Kids Club and Catalyst Kids to administer distance learning. I'll repeat that. District buildings without modifications are being safely used by lower wage, minimally trained staff and children of parents that are unable to pay even though school is somehow deemed unsafe. The situation is the definition of inequity and privilege. No, a return to campus won't be easy or normal, but fear isn't a sufficient reason to keep schools closed or an acceptable message to send children and families. Action is the antidote to fear, and with rapidly improving conditions, it is time to take action. Given the quality of teachers, quantity of resources, and Davis's low transmission rates, the goal of the district should be to fully open schools as opposed to putting up arbitrary barriers to keep them closed. This would involve opting into the state safe schools for all program. In the next few weeks, Yolo County will fall below the 25 case per 100K metric set by the program. Opting in will permit elementary schools to open and secure more than $3.8 million in additional funding for the district, see link two. We know younger children are at lower risk and benefit at least from distance learning and benefit the least from distance learning, a fact noticeably missing from reopening plans and recent meetings. Safe, open elementary schools will pave the way for the older students who also need to return this academic year. Bob Oldham, parent of two DGSU students, and he has included two links. The next public comment reads, hi, BOE. I'm encouraged to see that you're working to get back to school ASAP. Please excuse me if I've missed something, but I don't see anywhere the option for students to simply stay home. While I'd like to see every student in class tomorrow, I know there are many families who do not feel comfortable with their students going back in yet. Is there a reason an option for all remote cannot be offered? Respectfully sent, Jeremy Taylor. 
And the next comment comes from Tristan Leong and Alexandra Borak Leong. Dear Davis Joint, Unified School Board, I am asking you to set aside your implicit biases and your privilege tonight so that you can objectively understand that the ramifications of the motion you approved understand the ramifications of the motion you approved two days ago. As approved, the motion eliminates any possibility of a return to campus for the remainder of the school year. This is because DGUSD will not be able to meet the criteria you established. Full teacher vaccination, return to the red tier plus two weeks, school testing and development of a hybrid model with associated curriculum before the end of the current school year and possibly not for the next year either. The teacher vaccination requirements you established to initiate hybrid model instruction are not measurable or enforceable. How can the district track when a teacher has been given the opportunity to receive two vaccines? two doses of the vaccine. In addition, the testing component is too vague and does not specify a measurable standard. Either Tuesday's motion was presented from an outside party and not reviewed and vetted before being presented at a public meeting, or you simply overlooked significant and glaring flaws in your own document. For example, the language in the motion requires that the vaccines be, quote, FDA approved, end quote. There is no existing FDA approved vaccine. The two currently available have been distributed under an emergency use authorization, which is not the equivalent of FDA approval. Your criteria for reopening Davis schools is legally indefensible and will stymie opportunities to leverage critical funding through the state. In addition, they will likely be at odds with soon to be released directives from the federal government. The board, at a minimum, must bring the language of this motion back to the table and fix these fundamental flaws that are embarrassing to see in a public document instead of working on the minutia of an overly complicated hybrid model that no interest group wants you need to fix the underpinnings of the framework that you are setting forth further if the board revises this motion and keeps the teacher vaccination requirement and the quote red tier end quote requirement to bring children back into the classroom then there is no longer any objective rational reason reason to have a hybrid model as the teachers would now be vaccinated the L air filtration systems would be fixed and upgraded everyone would be wearing a mask seconds. and all individuals would be getting frequent testing to screen asymptomatic individuals then all theoretical chains of transmission within a school setting are freaky feasibly broken. In light of Tuesday's language, the board must now clearly explain the rationale for continuing to advance a hybrid model with a distance learning component. We urge the board to immediately revise Tuesday's motion to fix its flawed criteria and to direct your staff that to replace the minutes. hybrid approach. The next public comment comes from Robert V.O. Van Ostrand. Dear DJUSD School Board, I am a parent of two daughters in fourth and fifth grade in Davis. I teach and conduct research to earn my pay, and I am struggling to do the job of two full-time teachers to teach my kids plus my own job. My younger child is increasingly growing resistant to learning at home. Every day is a struggle because of school closure. As our top medical experts, the CDC, the European version of the CB CDC, the World Health Organization, and all, all recommend getting kids back in school as soon as possible, it is clear the board is not fulfilling its mission. You are not prioritizing children's education. It is clear at least four of five members do not want to listen to our experts. I wonder how on earth such educated people, one, stopped listening to our experts, and two, that children's education is no longer a top priority to the DJUSD school board, and three, shows a general rejection to science. The public is going to have to find another way to do what's right for our kids and reopen schools as experts recommend, whether through switching to private school or using legal avenues to require we reopen. Best, Robert Van Ostrand. The next comment comes from John Whitehead. Hi, my name is John Whitehead, a recent former DJUSD 
parent. Thanks to my son's excellent education at DHS, including Steve Harvey's robotics program and several advanced placement classes, he finished his BS degree in electrical engineering in less than four years at UCLA in March 2020. He was lucky to avoid remote, remote learning last spring, but you can laugh with me that started that starting in the fall, he had to do both remote learning and remote teaching in graduate school. My comment this evening is that I noticed the mention of Medify MA40 air purifiers on the agenda. I just wanted to say I hope that the school system is teaching students and families that we would all have clean cleaner indoor air and cleaner neighborhood air if people did less burning in fireplaces and wood stoves. This information is especially important for health right now because lung damage from smoke particles makes people more susceptible to catching COVID-19. Thank you and best wishes to all regarding the difficult planning and decision making for returning students to classrooms. Our next comment reads, Dear Davis School Board Members, I write this public comment to you this evening and ask that you please pause and think of the safety of our teachers and staff and students before opening up our schools. It is no secret that vaccines are still being rolled out. Since teachers and aides are frontline workers, we must ask ourselves, for what reason would we risk our teachers, school employees, and children put our risk putting our teachers, school employees, and children at risk if the safety is truly our top priority? As a parent of three children who desperately wants to see their friends and teachers and get back to their sports and extracurricular activities, I understand parents who want to get back to a, quote, some sense of normalcy. However, there is so much at risk, the lives of our children, teachers, and staff, as well as the community. I lost a brother to COVID-19, and I have two nephews and another brother who caught it and have recovered from it. COVID is not like recovering from a cold. We must take it very seriously, be patient, and do all we can to protect our community. If we return in the fall, chances are that the majority of our community will be vaccinated. I understand that these times are challenging and you have pressure from certain groups to return to school. However, as the governing body over the schools our children attend, it is imperative to put safety and lives first. Respectfully, Cecilia Escamilla Greenwald. The next comment reads, Dear Trustees, I read with the disappointment that the board board voted not to open schools for in-person education until the county has been in the red tier for at least two weeks for both elementary and secondary schools. This equates to a case rate below seven cases for 100,000. However, the state has determined it's safe for elementary school children to return when the case rate is below 25 cases per 100,000, over three times as high as DGSD's threshold. As both the California Department of Public Health and Dr. Sisson advise, it's particularly important that K-2 students return as po soon as possible as the harmful impact of school closure are particularly acute for younger students who are also less likely to be infected or pass the infections. Distance learning does not provide adequate educational opportunities for younger students. Private school students in town have in-person education, full days, no less, and they are able to make it work safely. I strongly encourage you to follow the guidance or both the California Department of Public Health and our local health officer that younger elementary school students return to school when the case rate has fallen below 25 and then allow older children to return as the cases continue to decline. Thank you for considering my comment. And that is unsigned. Next comment reads, Dear DJSD Board of Education members, I have reviewed the draft six elementary A and PM hybrid model plan that will be discussed at tonight's meeting. And while I commend you for the enormous task to try to create a new model for schooling and support students, educators, and their families in the process, I am disappointed about what happens to be the lack of planning and concern regarding students who, for various reasons, may need to continue distance learning. Removing those children from the teachers and students who they have spent the past six months with would cause them additional emotional stress and academic hardship on top of the traumatic year all students have had to face so far. I recognize that some families may need their students to return to in-person schooling, but the safest way by far for our students to finish out the year and to curtail the spread of the virus is by staying home. Students who opt for this option should not be punished by being removed from their classes and the teachers and classmates that they have spent six months building a rapport with. Rushing to reopen when we're in the red tier, which means that the caseload is significantly higher than what we were experiencing when schools closed back in March, is, in my opinion, a reaction to pressure from parents who are pushing a return to school. We have seen schools throughout the state reopen and have to close again, which adds more trauma and stress to our students and teachers. There's no significant data to show that reopening is safe, especially when community members continue to ignore public health guidance and gather in groups. 
assigning children who opt to continue distance learning to a new teacher and to a program outside of the mainstream classes in this new model is preferring the needs of one group or over the other. This plan seeks to support the social, emotional, and academic needs of one particular subset of the community, but at the expense of another. Public education is supposed to be concerned with equity for all students. Thank you for your consideration. Krista Conerato, Birch Lane Elementary School parent. The next comment reads, dear members of the board, please think of the kids and teachers who already have established the routine and know how to deal with Canvas and Zoom. What is the benefit of disrupting this routine? Kids who have a hard time distance learning can join small cohorts. It's unfair to disrupt the routine of the kids who are doing well at distance learning and make them suffer. We don't want to have to change teachers at the end of the year. We love our teachers and we trust them. We do not want to be assigned to different teachers. Having the teachers vaccinated is crucial, but it is not, not enough to keep the community safe. Rehaf Alfara. And the next comment reads thank you to the board for all of your work i urge you to follow the science as you navigate these tough decisions as a parent of a child who receives additional services you would think i would support the return to school however i feel strongly about the hybrid model and believe it would further reinforce the disparity among students forcing parents to choose between risking illness for their children in households and teachers or keeping them at home furthermore a physical return to school could potentially be more disruptive if COVID cases are found in certain classrooms. This would force entire classes to quarantine for 10 days. Additionally, using vaccines as one of the conditions to return to school leaves out a large population of potential virus transmitters, the students. As a member of the public health community, I urge you to wait for more guidance from both the federal level and the state level before making additional decisions on returning to school. Thank you for your time, Ada Barros. And the final public comment this evening comes from Elise Bruin, teacher and parent. Dear Board of Education, and community. I am frustrated that the reopen community is claiming that science is on their side and the people who hesitate during a surge with that with new strains that are more infectious are illogical. Even the articles on the reopen website, in fact, claim that reopening makes sense with a whole slew of requirements and only for younger students, not those in middle and high school, and do not support what they are asking for. I truly appreciate that you consider actual studies on COVID-19 and making your parameters for reopening. I am also frustrated that this community is urgently concerned about the inequities in education, but I don't see but don't seem to care about these inequities in normal times. As a teacher, I can tell you that my heart is broken every single day by the inequities in our town, state, and country. I see these up close in my classroom, and I hope that all of the people who are writing impassioned letters about this will continue to work for equity when it no longer affects them personally. Thank you for potentially erring on the side of caution and for actually basing decisions on science, despite people claiming you are not. This situation situation is very hard, but it would be much harder if our community members begin to die or suffer from long-term COVID-19 and our children feel they are to blame. Sincerely, Elise Bruin, teacher and parent. And that concludes public comment, President Denunzio. Thank you very much, Director Bernard. I appreciate your uh, efforts to read those public comments and also those of uh, Public Information Officer Clayton. Uh, thank you again to everyone who wrote in with their comments. Uh, diverse points of view are very important for us to hear. Um, thank you also to those who communicated with us but who decided they uh, preferred not to have their comments read as public comments. We appreciate all of that. Uh, and uh, thank you again. So um, we're gonna turn now to discussion on this matter and um, I'd like to start with our student trustees uh, to hear their uh, perspective on uh, the secondary hybrid model since uh, in particular, they're both secondary students. Um, so Mr. Lee, if we could start with you with any comments or questions that you may have for staff about this item. Um, but yeah, so right off the bat, I don't really have any big concerns about the implementation of the hybrid model, I think that's a pretty good idea. But also, it looks like we've um, been like receiving a lot of conflicting ideas 
about the hybrid model. Um, do we know that if we're only implementing it, um, if vaccines are out, like people are asking, or if there'd be a possibility that we might be starting the hybrid model before vaccines are completely released for the public? Sure, I can take that question and um, it will allow an opportunity to provide an important update uh, to the community and allow staff to fill in uh, any details um, after my update. At our board meeting on Tuesday, uh, January 19th, uh, two days ago, we approved the conditions upon which uh, staff and students would return in a hybrid model. And two important parts of that, which are variables outside of our uh, control, um, include uh, being in the red tier uh, for two weeks and uh, making sure that two vaccination shots are available, um, have been made available to employees, and they have up to uh, two weeks uh, to recover from uh, any side effects. Um, uh, there were some internal uh, variables that are within our control that are also important uh, as far as coming back in a hybrid model. And those include making sure um, that we have asymptomatic testing in place on or near each campus, that our classrooms are set up for six foot or greater distancing for students, teachers, and staff. Um, uh, we have equipped, uh, but also part of the motion, MERV 13 filters in all of our uh, classrooms. And we are obtaining air purifiers for all classrooms, the Cal OSHA safety protocols uh, and COVID-19 safety requirements are in place. And um, you know we've continually worked to refine and have implemented our notification, quarantine and contact tracing uh, program. So with all those conditions met, we're ready for a return to campus with a secondary hybrid model. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Any other questions uh, or comments, Mr. Lee? Um, no, that was the main concern that I had, but thank you for answering my thank question. You. Thank you very much for your question. Um, Ms. Ortega Nunez, um, questions or comments uh, on this matter from you, please. Yes, I do. Okay. First, I would like to start with the fact that I like how the model was designed. It's very reassuring to know that our schedules will be the exact same and that my family won't be forced to choose a specific model to avoid having to drop some of my classes or my siblings. So thank you. Uh, I really like that you will be doing the mock lessons with uh, peers and using that technology. I think it's a great way to help the teachers feel less anxious and to feel more comfortable and prepare when we go back to school. Uh, now I go with my questions. Um, I was wondering if once uh, the hybrid model is implemented, will the teachers have to change their plans for the school year or will they keep the same plan? Let me ask uh, Associate Superintendent Boon Choi or Director Allen to take your question. Sure, I'll take it. And Director Allen, if you wanna fill in any, uh, uh, any gaps. Uh, so thank you, Mariana. It's a great question as we think about uh, what the scope and sequence of the curriculum will look like. Uh, as you've heard from Dr. Bowes at the beginning of every uh, presentation, we walk through the, the principles um, of reopening and one of them is continuity. And the intent, what that means essentially is that how can we transition into a hybrid model or, or even back to distance learning and keep going with our curriculum and content and instruction so that we can get to um, you know, the important standards that we need to uh, address. So one of the things about uh, the simulcast and the secondary uh, schedule is that since there won't be a, a break in, in or a doubled up instruction because students are, um, are choosing distance learning or not, teachers can continue uh, with the content uh, that they have for the remainder of the year. Uh, but that but that is still going to require some uh, re-evaluation of what it means, given that students will be in both virtual and in-person formats. So our planning and our, and our intent is that we provide some professional development time for teachers to make sense of, of any adjustments that may need to take place 
uh, given the fact that they're teaching their students at the same time in an in-person and virtual format. So all that's to say is at, at a high level, we don't anticipate significant or major changes uh, to the scope and sequence, but we still have a lot of work to do to actually understand what the practical day-to-day -day implications are going to be, and which may require some, some adjustments. And for that reason, we want to create the time for our teachers to really get their heads wrapped around uh, what instruction will look like, provide them some time to work with each other, with their departments, um, and make any uh, appropriate adjustments. When that time comes, we'll have a better idea of what changes will, will need to be made. Great, thank you. Um, about that, actually, I was wondering if the teachers will maybe have an assistant during class because teachers already sometimes miss comments or raise hands even when we're all on, the, on our computers. And I think that might happen more often once we start using the hybrid model and we have the students physically there and then others on the computer. Very important question. Um, and that's the biggest question our teachers are raising right now is how do I manage, you know, I have students on a screen and I have students in front of me. And so what, you know, what does that mean for me as a, as a teacher to ensure that I'm, I'm addressing the needs of, uh, of both of my students? And that that's also gets to the, the issue of equity and who has more access uh, during instruction that's, uh, that's like that in a dual environment. So uh, when I outlined the professional development um, uh, strategy, uh, I talked about the, the, uh, the hands-on learning uh, that will identify the core practices that teachers really need to focus on in order to get adjusted to the, uh, um, to the hybrid model. And, and the simulcast is the number one uh, teaching practice that we're going to have to support teachers with. Our instructional coaches have been doing quite a bit of work uh, in preparing for that professional development, uh, not only attending uh, workshops uh, that are currently being um, put out there uh, to identify best practices for blended learning and hybrid learning, uh, but also outreach to districts that have been using simulcast uh, so that we can identify what those best practices look like. Uh, I've been contacting other districts that are using hybrid right now in a simulcast format to see what tools and technology might be helpful uh, so that we can make sure we, we can identify students who have questions and needs, um, as well as finding ways to uh, uh, encourage interactions between students who are in person and in a virtual uh, format too. So that, that's a very important question you're asking, and we, uh, you know, we're in the process of coming up with a professional learning plan to support our staff with it. Great, thank you. Also, I think I might have missed this, but I'm not sure if I did, but how big will each group be? Like, how big is group A and B expected to be? Hmm. Associate Superintendent Juanitas or Deputy Superintendent Best, do you want to take that? What well, I think the groups basically will be half the class. Um, it's based on being able to maintain six feet apart. And so you figure if a class has 32 students, a certain percentage of them probably won't return. They'll want to stay in distance learning. So then you take the numbers that do want to return in person and you basically divided in half. So we're hoping that a classroom would have, you know, 10 to 14 at the most so that we can socially distance. Okay, thank you. Um, and also during the break time periods that we have between classes, how will the students be dismissed to avoid other students coming in close contact with other students from other classes, like in the passing periods? Yeah, it's a good question, especially at a campus like Da Vinci, which has uh, very small hallways. And uh, you figure there's only going to be probably about 30% uh, of the total school population on campus at any one time. And so that in itself will allow fewer people. Um, but as we get closer, we'll look at bell schedules and see um, do we dismiss at slightly different times? But I think the big uh, way to mitigate this is we'll have quite a bit fewer people on campus. Thank you. Those were all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ortega-Nunez. Fantastic questions. Very much appreciated. Okay, we'll turn to trustees for questions. Uh, and um, Trustee Asmundson, um, perhaps I could uh, we could start with you, please. Sure. Um, 
I, I've really appreciated the feedback that we received in the all advisory meeting, um, the information that I've received from students and families and educators, both about what's going well and what, what we're hoping is going to be an improvement. And, and I want to thank everybody, as um, President Denuncio has already done, for reaching out to us through public comments and emails. Um, and, and I really do appreciate the work and the time and the effort that has been put into these models in my conversations with colleagues from other districts. It, I really have come to value the amount of work that we put into reaching out to our stakeholders and engaging them. Um, and so I want to thank the teachers and the staff for their thought and the care they put into this because they were really between a rock and a hard place in terms of trying to to make the best of a, of a difficult situation. And we can see that in the rubrics that we looked at here. We had, you know, for the same model, we've got some that are, some areas that are rated very high and some areas that are rated very low and some areas that are rated all the way across the board, um, depending on the perspective. Um, and that's really speaking to the trade-offs that we had to address in um, creating a model that, that is the best of a difficult situation for everybody. Um, I have a couple of detailed questions, and then I've got a couple of general questions. On slide 14, um, there was a note that for the last period of the day, the students all report to small group and then they're released. I'm just kind of wondering what the, what the purpose of that work time instruction time is. I can go ahead and answer that if you like. So the small group instructional time was really designed in case students need reteaching, if teachers wanted to check in on assignments that had been turned in and wanting to give feedback, I mean, kind of the just in time feedback, but also a space for students even to start their independent work and have a teacher there. What teachers were sharing with us early into quarter one was that if they didn't explicitly expect students to be there, sometimes students would just uh, start their independent work maybe late that night and then not ask questions when they had an opportunity to meet. So what we um, decided as a team was if all students are there, start their independent work or get feedback from teachers. And then the teacher says, I'm gonna work with five people on their thesis statement, everybody else I'll email you or you can check in later. It made it um, so they could have small group instruction, develop some relationships. And I think our students were really articulate about the fact that even if a lot of students are there and their screens are off and they're just starting their independent work or their homework, it was so satisfying for them to know that they could ask questions and have someone there. Because um, it's a lot of independent time and self-directed learning for our students. So that's a practice that has already been implemented sort of in response to continuous improvement. Yeah, and I know that a lot of teachers are also using that time to broker um, the peer-to-peer -peer interaction. If they're doing collaborative group assignments, that's often where they say, I'll put you in breakout rooms with your peers so that directed instruction or overview stuff happens during the class period, and then the peer interactions happen in the small group instruction time. That's that's nice to hear. Um, I know that this is slightly less of an issue for high school, but across high school and junior high school, how many, what percentage of our students are taking seventh period? Because, you know, we'll have that sort of issue with lunch in fourth quarter. Sure, we, uh, we pulled that number and at the junior high, the, it's almost 100% of the students are taking um, a seventh period. At Davis Senior High School, I think we figured it was roughly 700 kids that are scheduled. So if you're thinking about the hybrid model, kids that opt for distance learning plus breaking that in two, somewhere around 200 and 240 students on campus um, in any day for their seventh period lunch. But we feel like there will be space given, you know, the rough estimates of who we think will be there for seventh period in the junior highs to have spacing and, and figure that out for lunchtime. Yeah, our junior high principals are already working with student nutrition services and have talked about a couple of different models in terms of almost like staggering that the release of where they grab lunch in different areas for different classroom teachers to have their students and that sort of a thing. Um, so I, I think that we're kind of in different slides here, but I, and for me, it was slide 31, I think, where um, it was talking about devices are going to be provided. Um, can you tell me a little bit about it? Students already have devices, right? Like we've already done all the work in terms of getting everybody who needs one, a device and a hotspot. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about that piece? Sure, I can do that. Um, so yes, it, we understand that every student has a device and internet connection in the current scenario. When students come back 
to campus um, in grades three through 12, they are going to be bringing a one-to-one -one device between home and school every day. So it may be the one that they already have if they have a new Chromebook already checked out. It may be one that they're providing themselves. Um, but they will use it at home and at school, and we will make sure that that continues to be the case that they have that. In TK through two, they will not transport back and forth, but they will have a full Chromebook cart in their classroom. So they will have a one-to-one -one device for use all day in school, and they will continue to use whatever they have checked out from us or on their own at home so that we know that they have connectivity and a device both at home and at school. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So again, this is just sort of a continuation of what we've already got. This isn't something that we still need to implement. Right. The only, yeah, the only implementation that still needs to happen is we just need to make sure that everyone that has a Chromebook checked out and needs a Chromebook checked out has a nice new one that's going to uh, be theirs over the course of the next four years. So. I'm sure that you've talked to other districts, but we were one-to-one -one in my previous district and having sleeves for the students was a big, made a big difference in terms of transporting back and forth. Yeah, we have, yes, we have cases. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, I was, a, I personally was a teacher at St. James for a number of years, and I've been in communication with the St. James teachers and the staff regarding their reopening plans and their procedures. Um, and I know that there was really significant learning to adjust to this teaching model. I appreciate student trustee Ortega Nunez already, you know, kind of considering some of the ins and outs of this issue. Um, on some of the slides, we, we, we talk about the phases of that implementation. <clears throat> This is a significant shift. This does take a significant amount of learning and adjusting on the part of teachers in terms of they've already done a lot to adjust their instruction this year and they're gonna to have to adjust to something new. So I'm sort of wondering what is the timeline for beginning this sort of implementation of new learning considering we still have some other priorities at this point. We're, you know, we should still really be working on improving our current best practices for distance teaching and learning before we start moving into something else. So could you kind of give me the timeline on when this sort of thing would start? Yeah, I could speak uh, to some degree on the professional development and the scope and sequence of that. Um, I'm gonna ask Deputy uh, Best, uh, Superintendent Matt Best to speak to when this would actually begin because there are uh, discussions that we need to have with our, with our uh, bargaining partners or our, our labor partners as well, uh, as well as identifying getting a sense of uh, when the hybrid model would actually be implemented so that we can get the timing right. Um, when we think about the three phase launch, the, the important ones that are gonna need um, specific, specific carve out time would be, the, uh, would be phase one. And that's pulling our, our staff together uh, to orient them to the actual ins and outs of the model and identifying uh, in more specificity what the expectations would be within the construct of that particular model. When we look at the ed camp and the hands-on, those we uh, anticipate would be opportunities where teachers can focus explicitly, synchronously on the particular topics uh, that they're gonna need to prioritize for their professional development. As I mentioned for the secondary, the simulcast is at the top of the list and how we create time and space for them to one, get some input on best practices there. And then in further breakouts, uh, smaller breakouts, uh, create spaces for teachers to, to actually practice using simulcast with their peers, uh, which is actually a really powerful opportunity just to collaborate, deprivatize practice as, as, as we learn a new, uh, a new move and then reflect and, and, um, um, and, uh, and think about how we can bring this to our classroom. The ed camp component would also be a synchronous opportunity. And that's when uh, in real time staff would identify their most urgent needs as they think about uh, the first day of class and implementing a simulcast uh, uh, within the, uh, the hybrid model and then uh, moving quickly. I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with the EdCamp model, but you actually generate ideas, prioritize them immediately, and then you um, organize yourselves um, towards those topics that are most relevant to you and leverage the collective wisdom uh, from, from the team, from staff, in order to generate um, you know, uh, 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 ways forward discussion topics to help us build a better understanding. And then the, the foundational and the flexible phase two and phase three would be ongoing uh, work throughout the course of the uh, spring and, and, and the year and beyond 
The foundational pieces, we'd like to explore ways to use existing time within the schedule, staff collaboration time, and thinking creatively about how we create spaces for teachers to have ongoing check-ins and to use the collaboration spaces in Canvas to share best practices, to meet with their departments, to meet with peers, uh, et cetera. So we'd have to identify how that would fit by, by level and by department, um, but we wanna be intentional about creating that space. And then the flexible piece in phase three is that just-in-time support. How do we create spaces for our coaches to uh, provide resources or to answer questions, uh, et cetera. So all that's to say is we're looking, you know, and this, these are details that still need to be worked out, uh, but we're looking at, you know, in the, in the neighborhood of uh, three days plus or minus uh, for that phase one launch. And then, um, and then, and then we'd build out the uh, time within the existing schedule for phase two and three. Deputy Superintendent Best, do you want to add anything to timing? Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, time is always one of our scarcest resources. Um, and, you know, working with our association partners um, and instructional services team to figure out how long we think the training is going to take and then figuring out when that's going to happen and whether or not we need to, um, you know, cut synchronous instruction short to provide teachers time, pay them time at the end of the workday or on the weekends to, uh, to do that uh, training. All those things will be under discussion um, here as we finalize the plan. Okay, yeah, I, I want us to be efficient and prepared. I just want us to also be really thoughtful about where we're putting our time and energy when we have a number of competing priorities. Um, and then my last question came up in the all advisory from a parent. And one of the concerns about this model is, does it disadvantage students who would prefer to remain in distance learning for whatever reason, for safety or for whatever reason that they feel like they would prefer to stay in distance? That's a huge question around the equity of access uh, in this model. Um, and I think uh, that is uh, why we included one of the indicators around UDL for equity and access, which is universal design for learning so that whatever pedagogy and model we use, is it accessible for, uh, for everyone? Uh, that's also a, a feature of our professional development. So building that mindset and skill set to, to differentiate accordingly. Um, and there are a lot of challenges. I mean, if you think about it, if in a simulcast format, you already uh, inherently need to differentiate because you have students on the screen and students in person. And that's going to take a lot of getting used to and a lot of focus on the part of our teachers. And then you add UDL on top of that. You know, this is an enormous challenge. I mean, we're just just to be completely honest. So, uh, so that that is a concern. The other thing that's related to that comment, uh, Trustee Admonson, is uh, and this came out in the qualitative feedback in the advisories on the staff side, and that was, um, are there going to be uh, issues of access to materials and resources in, uh, between the students who are learning in the classroom? If you think of labs or you think of any type of hands-on experiences, and those who are simultaneously learning, and how we're going to mitigate or any uh, inequities or different or, you know, uh, challenges to access uh, for particular lessons. I think that's going to be one of those problems of practice we're going to have to, we're going to have to confront through our professional development as we uh, move into a hybrid model. So that is an important question and, um, and one that we're going to have to work together on to, to address. Thank you. That's, that's all my questions. Again, I just really appreciate the work that the action teams put into this. It, it, this is a difficult difficult thing to to find a good solution to thank you trustee asmundson um trustee dara uh questions and comments from you please thank you um uh, i would like to echo my thanks to the action teams and the all advisory committees for their work i was able to observe some of the um at uh, all advisory meetings and there's really a lot of uh, great conversation and thought and really thoughtful commentary and sort of breaking things apart to see how they can make it better. So I really appreciate that. Um, I had some logistical questions a little bit. I, I think this model transitions a bit easier from how the secondary students are already experiencing their learning, but for example, if a lot of more students than we expect choose to take the hybrid model and we have a capacity, room capacity issue with uh, in order to provide social distancing, have we thought about how that could play out if we end up having, um, say, a lot, you know, we, we think, you know, th that it's going to be 
some where 40, 60% of kids might do um, hybrid. But what if um, weather gets warm and people feel differently and a lot of kids want to go back? How do we plan to um, prioritize that or offer that for students? Um, I'll, t I'll take a, a stab at this one. So. Um, uh, with six feet of social distancing, if you take literally all the furniture out of the room except the desks and uh, teacher workspace, um, you can get 15 or 16 students in a room and maintain that distance. Um, it, it's a challenging teaching environment. I won't, I won't deny that. I mean, you'll have students sort of in all four corners up against the walls, you know, uh, all, all the way around. Uh, but you can do that. So I think that, um, uh, you know, well, that's possible, not ideal, but we could accommodate all students returning in a hybrid if, uh, you know, if that if that were to happen. I was thinking also about the passing periods. I see that they put in longer than normal passing periods between classes, but still, I wondered if there has been any thought about how that will play out. Um, being that we're social beings as humans, and um, kids will want to uh, talk, but I understand that, you know, they'll do their best to follow the guidelines, but I'm just wondering how, how we thought about how that could be um, done for the safest way for students to, to be able to pass between classes where there's like a lot of kids out at one time. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, that one of the reasons we changed those uh, passing periods to be a little longer was at the urging of our secondary administrators. Um, who are already thinking about how they might um, stagger classroom releases, uh, um, you know, uh, to try to control the number of students that are moving through hallways. And those are, there are some sites that are definitely more challenging than others. Um, you know, at Davis Senior High School, there's a couple walk, couple pathways between the north and south part of the campus that are, that are very, uh, could get very congested. So just thinking about each campus um, and how, uh, um, ensure that students are flowing around the campus uh, in a timely way, uh, but also in a way that um, maintains as much social distance as possible. They're starting to think about the, whether we need to have one-way walkways, um, all those sorts of uh, logistical details. They're, they're starting to work their way through to maintain the uh, social distancing as much as possible uh, and deal with the realities of having uh, students on their campus and knowing uh, that those students are, are not always gonna share the same uh, level of, uh, of uh, sticking to those health procedures as we might want. And then if we were to have um, a positive COVID case detected on campus, can you um, explain a little bit about the process for, for how that will look um, while we're in hybrid? Second yeah, I'll have Laura take that one and maybe start with the contact tracing and on to the response. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we're already doing these procedures now within the cohorts. So when we're notified of a case, uh, the first thing we do is we document it with our COVID-19 reporting form. Um, one of our contact tracers, one of our nurses, will... Um, if the person's not yet in school, they'll they'll call the family, they'll call the staff member, they'll find out who they've been in contact with, they'll figure out if we have to make decisions on closing uh, a building or closing a cohort. So in a hybrid model, you assume, let's say a student in a class tests positive, um, the first thing we would do if it's during the day, we would pull the entire cohort out um, do health assessments, send people home with the advice that they need to be tested. Um, since we'll have uh, saliva testing on campus for asymptomatic people, we could, uh, we've already talked to Healthy Davis together that we could bring a testing crew to the campus and test everybody. Um, and then it takes a couple days. So the cohort would have to be in distance learning while we're waiting for the test results. Um, if the tests come back negative, um, depending on the type of exposure, we could bring the cohort back. Um, but the general guidelines, if you have a positive test, is that the entire cohort is shut down for um, 10 days from the date of the positive test or 10 days from the time somebody has been asymptomatic. Um, and then we also have reporting procedures. We report it to the health department. Um, sometimes they want us to do some additional contact tracing, so we work closely with them. Um, and then 
we don't, we always tell families and staff that we've quarantined that, you know, we will be calling you towards the end of that quarantine period, checking in, making sure people really have resolving symptoms. Sometimes people are still quite ill after the 10 or 14 days and you have to extend it. Um, and so we take each case individually. Um, we also send out a letter to anybody that's been exposed. Um, if it's on a school campus, we'll send the letter out to the entire staff, uh, not just the one class, but of course we keep the particulars of the case confidential. Um, but we give enough information so that people can have a sense, oh yeah, okay, I was on campus at that time. I need to be monitoring my symptoms. I could have been exposed. We also put in our letter to make sure reach out to us to our COVID uh, reporting line so that you'll get a call back from a nurse to answer any questions that you have. Um, one thing we've really taken very seriously with our contact tracing is the education piece of it. So a lot of people, even when they've been in touch with their doctors, they still have lots of questions about what quarantine means, what isolation means. Um, and so we educate and re-educate and educate again. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So a question I've had posed to me from um, community members re regarding the potential of, of back to school hybrid is, um, can we compel students or staff members to take COVID tests as a requirement to be attend school? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take this one. We, we do not believe so. That's been the advice of our, of our legal counsel. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think those are the questions I have. I may come across some more as we as we go further along. I just want to thank you again for all the work getting us to this point. I know it feels slow to our community at times, but this thorough work um, really, I think, if, if we're able to get these kids back on campus, all this work will make it safer for them. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee Dar. Uh, Trustee Heider, uh, questions or comments from you, please. Yeah, um, not a lot of questions. I do just want to um, acknowledge to the public that uh, we have seen these models multiple times. Tonight's not the first time and uh, that they've been diligently studied um, with the work groups, with the advisory councils, with all of us on multiple meetings. And I just wanted to make sure there's comfort there that there's there's been a full review other than uh, this evening. Um, I also just want to acknowledge the district um, and this, the whole um, cabinet that you guys said you would do this work and present it on January 21st. And you said that back in December when you didn't know how this process was going to go or what the outlook was going to be, and you delivered. And I think that that's really important in that the commitment that you made and working as hard as you had to to make it happen. And I want to say thank you for that because uh, in a time of uncertainty, having that stake in the ground and knowing that this was the day for that, it, it, it means something right now. Um, as far as the work and the process, uh, I just think that the planning that's put into it now does nothing but um, save chaos and uncertainty on the, on the other side of it. And, uh, and so I just I feel like it's just been incredibly worthwhile um, 